Things moving. Uh, it's 622, uh, and I'm going to call the July 9th, 2019 Governing Board meeting of CB Fiber to order. Um, any additions to or changes to the agenda? Or we, uh, move. we still want to move the Business Development Committee re report back to before the Treasurer's report. You still want to do that earlier? Um, I'm still here. Yeah, we would like to. Okay, let's do that then. Anything else? I just have the revised policy. Okay. Um, Grant submission. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'll put that after the survey results. If we have uh, anything to report from that uh, revised policy. Okay. Uh, public comments? Okay, hearing none. Let's start with the Business Development Committee report back. Okay, yeah. the Business Development Committee met on January 9th, June 25th, and we uh, had good attendance. Um, the agenda covered a lot of things, a lot of discussion items. We discussed the integration of feasibility studies, and we had a long discussion about um, the WEC study and our study. And, we came out of that discussion with a recommendation for the board that to explore having two members from this board try to work with WEX committee on their feasibility study. So we should perhaps have a motion to make on, on, on that kind of a recommendation. But it would be a two-way street. We need to have them participate in our study as well in terms of minimizing uh, total application and get a bigger bang for our market face Okay. So we had a discussion on that. And we also had a discussion, and this is something that the policy committee will probably have to deal with. Um, there are a number of, of talented people on this board who could offer consulting services to any contractor that was hired. And so a policy on whether <coughs> anybody on the board can be paid as a sub-consultant to a consultant. I'd like to recommend that there be something developed on that. Um, and maybe else in the, in the mini meeting was address that. But anyway, that came up as a potential issue. We have some pretty talented people in the room on that topic. Um, we spent a bunch of time talking about draft plan elements. We didn't get very far on developing the scope of work for feasibility study, but we've started, and we'll have more on that at the next meeting. Um, the Callus pilot survey was put out on June 18th on Front Porch Forum, and in checking in yesterday, there are 21 people who responded through yesterday, which is certainly not a large take. So it's in today's, a repeat in tonight's Front Porch Forum in Callus to see what we get. But quite a bit of support. Um, but I think it's you know, people are filling it out that you know are interested. In. So getting a, a real survey done is going to take some leg work, and uh, looking for some you know volunteers in each town to, uh, to to do work on that. And in, in some in related news, I reached out to Front Porch Forum today to see if we could be. Um, or since somebody had mentioned this before, I tried to create my um, I tried to create myself as chair as a government position that covered all 17 towns. So I can do CB federal broadcasts to all yeah. the other towns. I'm a, I think anybody on the board can do that. Okay. I think because that's. I mean, they asked me if I want to send it to everybody. Okay. I think. Anyway, I mean, don't. I sent it only to Calus. Um, we also had a discussion on website content priorities. Uh, Jared is still waiting to complete a file of uh, minutes and agendas and whatever other materials we want to put in there. He would also like input on people want to look at the dev development site and I'll send out the link to that development site to everybody um, in terms of either, either organization or suggestions for how it could be better organized he's willing to, to do all that but he wants somebody to do that and he doesn't want to you know turn off the other site until somebody has said oh yeah it looks good so if that could happen in the next three weeks it'd be great but, you know it's just been so I'll send out the address um, we discussed the Department of Public Services RFP for a feasibility study of electric companies offering broadband service. And we, we recommend that somebody from the board or the committee stay on top of this study. The proposals were due on July 1st, so we don't know if they're in the process of reviewing them or not. It was the 
out of the, the legislation that passed that the department was supposed to do its own study about feasibility of electric utilities getting into broadband. So that's our recommendation on that. Um, was there a suggestion about who that person would be? Yeah, we didn't make a suggestion that Michael, did we make it? Did, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, it's not going to be Kevin would be a good person. Who would it be? Ken. Yeah, actually, yeah. he's not here. So he's not here. He's volunteer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but he was at that meeting. He was at our meeting. He was, he was pushing the idea. He was the one that yeah. Okay. All right. And, and, and he's, he's from ACCD. He's working with the Department of Public yeah, Service. Anyway. So. And, and that, it might be good, too, to have the, that the person that is doing that also be the one who might be working with WEC. And he's also the one in the committee that's been scoping the scope of work and the integration. And he's, he's pretty high on all this stuff. So. Sure. I think it's a good person. We recommend two people. Right. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, we ended up in a pro and con discussion on um, fiber and electric space. And, uh, and yeah. it's interesting it's pros and cons on that. Um, and, you know, and I'm not an expert on this. We have two people on the committee that seem to know a lot about it. Um, but uh, it was, it's not a simple decision. That's what I came away from the meeting. You know, that fiber goes in the electric space, or you do some combination. That's one of the things that came out of the discussion I heard. Um, so you're saying it would go above the phone? Above. Uh, I'll let Michael explain the, the rationale that we discussed. When we have our, our open yeah. discussion about the more okay. strategic. Okay. So, so the, the last thing, in terms of the elements of the feasibility study, and I want, like everybody, to, to get their own ideas. There was a discussion in the group that we want the feasibility to look at the, and understand rate schedules and options as part of the feasibility study. So, you know, one rate, multiple rates, what's the experience from a consultant's perspective around the country of how that's worked? We think we need help on that. Um, looking at demand aggregation software to find out where, who's, who's, who should be getting the services first. I think that was another topic that came up. There's two different softwares out there that allows you to look at that. One of the ideas is having neighborhoods fight with each other over, over getting servers. And the last discussion was trying to find some way of pushing um, a <coughs> program for cable uh, fiber optic stuff in the Vermont tech school system around the state. And that was the end of our lengthy discussion on that night. Uh, we're meeting again. We're trying to meet <coughs> two weeks before this meeting. And so, in terms of the motion the, of trying to get two people assigned to work, or um, I'd like to make a motion that we do that. I don't have names for recommendation other than Ken, but. Well, maybe we put that out there that everybody here at the moment. Does anybody want to be, want to be a liaison with uh, Washington Electric Co-op? I have to say they're a, so Michael? So Michael and Michael and Ken? Yeah. And Ken has previously, and Ken has previously yeah. said that he'd be willing to do this. I don't want to volunteer him. He doesn't want to really volunteer. Is there anybody else who's interested in doing that? Okay, so uh, I move that we uh, appoint Ken Jones and Michael Birnbaum to be uh, CB Fiber's liaisons with uh, Washington Electric Co-op as they develop their feasibility study. So, any further discussion? And, we're, and, add, and we would request that they appoint two people to meet with us. Yeah. Okay, we, we, yeah. we'll do that in the second motion. Was there another organization that they would also be uh, liaising with, for lack of a better term? Yeah, of or was it only. Okay. We don't know of any. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they, they can tell us. I mean, to point, when they start. Moving forward. They'll go and bring them power, I guess. Mm -hmm. Presumably. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was confused by some of the earlier discussions. So, yeah. so you, were, you guys are hearing about public service. And yeah, I, I think that's a little separate. Mm -hmm. We don't have a really role in that study, potential role in that study. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Would it make sense of what, what's the role? Like, meaning, when you leave, like, how's that, what's the mechanics? So the, the, the thing that came out of the discussion was that when the RFP is put together, that there's some synergy between if this duplication, if we're going to do a survey or a compiled survey, you know, in other words, make it efficient. And I think they have their own agenda, we have our agenda, but there's certain right. things that are probably right. shared. Right. That's okay. probably the, the main thing, and, and try to save money. 
car. Like, be efficient about that. Okay. okay, anything else? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstaining? Okay, motion passes. Thank you very much. And so we should Thank also probably us. request that they that formally establish a liaison with us or for the purposes of, of what, just my own? Uh, oh, oh, the white liaison with us. Yeah. Um, is it, is well, we, we would like there to be a liaison committee comprised of four people, two from them and two from us, um, so that we're aware of each other's activities so that we can encourage this direction, they can encourage that direction. Okay. Um, the, the, the moment that we constitute a committee, then we start triggering all sorts of uh, open meetings and public records requirements. So liaison is not a committee? It's liaison different. is not a committee. So we don't need to. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So we can have them working with WAC. That seems reasonable. But, okay. in, but in terms of, uh, but on a sort of a, a, good point. a more, more ad hoc basis. So we, we can imagine that they, the four of them would be meeting, and that makes sense. I mean, but in the, in the past, it's been Barry Just and Steve. Yep. I mean, is there somebody else that it, that it would be? It might be Powell. It might be Dan Weston. Oh, I suppose it could be strong. That's true. Okay, so I will move that we request the Washington Electric Co-op appoint two people to, uh, to liaison liaisons to us. So I second. second. Okay, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Anything else, David? No. That's it for tonight. All right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I have to leave. Thanks, David. Have a good night. See you. Okay, uh, anything else the Business Development Committee, other Business Development Committee folks? Do you want to talk about any of the things you've raised or wait for general discussions? Um, does anybody want to weigh in on the board members being paid as a subcontractor to our contractors? I think that's, that's oh, for other people <laughs> besides us should talk about that, I think. Um, well, I, if you go back to the enabling statute, this this is contemplated, this type of activity where board members are going to uh, have conflicts of interest. There's a very liberal, uh, you know, a liberal rule as far as the board being able to make decisions with a room full of people that have conflicts of interest. In other words, the short version being if this whole room were filled, uh, you know, we have a quorum to hold a meeting, if a motion gets put out to vote and eight of you guys have a conflict of interest, that's no problem. We can still have a vote. And it's just that if, you have, if you're engaged in that, if you have the conflict of interest, you wouldn't be able to participate in the vote. So I, I, is it necessarily good? I don't know if it's good or bad, but I think the law anticipates that sort of a, it seemed like they uniquely anticipated it in setting up these uh, Communications union districts because so, I haven't seen things like that in other places. So, so straw poll, how many of you think that that sort of structure where one of our board members is a subcontractor to a contractor that we are paying, do you think that that is a conflict of interest? Okay. And some of you have yes, but we could, we could recognize it and accept it. Conflict of interest. Sure, and, but, and, but we would just need to then react appropriately and make sure that w those people who are. You know, who do have conflicts, you know, we identified this, you know, early on last year with you, Michael, because you have another company doing something rather similar. So mm -hmm. whenever there's gonna be a conflict, you'd recuse yourself and we'd get out of their way. Okay. Yeah. And I think the feeling was that collectively in the board there's a lot of knowledge and a consultant comes from elsewhere and they're gonna be asking us, and we're like, Well, how do they come you know, the fancy writing and the compiling, we we're doing all the work here. So mm -hmm. you know, we'd be overall less expensive as well, I believe, could be negotiated where uh, consultant is gathering information but isn't, isn't researching at all, isn't pulling together. The alternates could go. Yes, that's, yeah. that's true. And, 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 so. and in fact, un unpaid uh, in-kind work is was expected and written into the USDA uh, grant proposal as well. So, but in terms of somebody getting paid, I think that's that's what changes this a little bit, right? Yeah, so um, transparency is the important bit here, mm -hmm. and the recusal by the board member. Mm -hmm. um, the obligation to uh, disclose 
uh, could really rest with two people. One is the board member, who mm -hmm. may or may not disclose, but the other one would be the contractor. If we're going to do a deal with a contractor, we would want that contractor to disclose their subcontractors, especially if there are any subcontractors that they intend to uh, employ from the board. That's so. a good point. Or from the campaign entities. So for just devil's advocate <laughs> discussion purposes, um, does it raise undue influence that, I mean, does it put certain towns at a disadvantage versus other towns because you can then steer direction of what happens in the process and other people have less information and less knowledge of that. I think it could raise undue influence in a lot of spheres, not right. just which towns get picked. Right. So there would have to, maybe there needs to be a little oversight in, in that kind of situation. Uh, there are, so number two, loss of expertise or reliance. And, you know, I view the board as more of a, we're a, we're a motivating administrative force to make this happen and to bring together towns. Um, if we're relying on board members who also have expertise and then they're no longer a board member to lose the expertise. Not that, you know, just throwing that out there. Um, and then just the general appearance of it, I, it doesn't make a good headline. <laughs> so I, that's, yeah, so those just, I'm just throwing those out there, those came to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, managing conflicts of interest is not an unusual thing, especially in, in Vermont. I mean, it's, a small place and everybody has a, a, a day job. So these things will happen. It's not like we would lose a board member forever. We would just lose them in the consideration of those things that where there could be a perceived conflict. So I'm not I'm not sure that um, um, I'm not sure that, that, that would we'd really run into that problem too much and, and frankly um, you know we're all trusting each other to be above board and you know with only a, a handful of exceptions that have mostly been resolved. Um, everybody has been. So I, I think, you know, because we respect our communities and the responsibility that they place on our shoulders, I think everybody continuing to be above, above board is going to be, uh, is going to allow us to move forward and hopefully not trip over our own shoelaces about this. Did you have something, Juan? Well, no, actually, you said it. I, I just want to, I'll, I'll just tag on one last thing. There's enough people on the board so that if one or two people have to recuse themselves because of a conflict, there's a lot of other expertise. It's, it's one of the geniuses of a committee system. It can be a little bulky at times, but it allows for you know enough input from enough different sources. And I, I, I would think with a board this size, I, we're not going to run into any serious troubles with recusals. So at the risk of violating his privacy, uh, I think it's useful to explain that Greg was the person who was thinking of offering consulting services. It wasn't me. And Greg is, is in a position where he's, 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 he's growing vegetables. His, the conflict is not the same kind as would exist if I was doing it, because he's just drawing on his expertise and saying, I can help the consultant get there faster. And that seems pretty attractive to me. Um, so, so that you understand that. Yeah, and, get, and getting there faster is something I think we're all interested in. But you know, Lu Lucas is there waiting in the wings on those things where we might be voting on a contract that includes you, mm -hmm. and that makes. Yeah, I I don't fundamentally have a, have a problem with that. I think it uh, also it's largely dependent on what the feasibility study entails and what is being looked for and what you, the consultant so. As, but in terms of local knowledge, uh, you know, collectively, you know, we have that, and the consultant's going to be saying, well, tell me about this or that, or, you know, resource, whereas if it's, this is the best way to write the proposal for uh, a USDA grant or loan, and they have expertise in that, that you know, that's the value, mm -hmm. right? But the details that need to come from local, you know, so as an example, if they say, well, we need to have uh, surveys done, uh, you know, to, to see the interest, well, we're the ones that are going to be doing that work, not why pay a consultant to do it, to say, you know, I'll call all my uh, friends and neighbors and get them to go online to complete the survey, and then the consultant gets paid for it. Right. You know, so, 
it largely to me depends upon what we're asking in that RFP. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, I do think that it needs to be completely above board, though I think that everybody has to be aware. I mean, if, if you're even approached by a contractor to be a subcontractor, even if you don't accept it, that you should know, that we should know as a board and all of them should know, so that it's all, you know, basically, as I say, common knowledge that who, who's working or who isn't working, et cetera, with their contractor. But you really don't have a choice. Like you say, we, we're all invested. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. You can put a key personnel approval clause in contracts too, so that then the board would know, you know, instead of just necessarily getting a laundry list of their employees and all the freelancers that they work with and everybody else, right. would, you would put in the contract a key personnel clause that we would have to, that the board would have to sign off on who's working on that particular contract, right. and that would make it super transparent. For me, it's just I don't want surprises. Just, just tell me. Just tell me what, what's yeah, going on, and everything will be fine. We can work with whatever, but I just, I, don't, I didn't like the surprises we had last year. So <laughs> you were the only one. Okay. So, so it sounds like uh, when we get to the point where we're putting together. Uh, Contracts and uh, and such that we can we can request that that the contractors are also not going to provide us with any surprises. <laughs> okay. So do we want to refer to those surprises? To right? Policy yeah. committee to have us start. Does, does it need? I, I don't know that it needs to be a specific policy. This is just something that we're going to need to put in the contract. Right. We just need to make sure that it appears in the contract. It means it's okay. it's policy under statute, like yeah. like like Rama said, yeah. and I think. I'm not sure that we need to, to restate okay. that necessarily. I mean, that, that's my own opinion. If anybody wants to be up for it, that's the progress. I think it's not reasonable. Okay. Sounds good. Anything else on uh, Business Development Committee? Okay. Treasurer's report. Okay. We have 10 more dollars than we have last time. <laughs> <laughs> Every month, right? Yes, every month. And uh, <laughs> bank fees, interest, anything that would be different other than that? No. Okay. Um, and uh, however, we do so. Um, Andrew, the last email that I saw, I think we were like they were confused about which grant you were talking about. Well, that was just so. Yeah, just to, for everybody. Uh, Town of Cabot has an investment fund on the CCIF um, that was related to a USDA grant from I don't know that, I can't give you all the history accurately. Um, but I applied through that for a $500 grant just to help with the cash match. Um, and it's it's actually a, there's a separate board that the ministry that brings out the grant. It comes from the town, but it's not general obligation. The concern was that if it was general obligation based, we couldn't take it, but it's not. And I confuse CCA, which is the nonprofit that has nothing to do with the CCIF, just because everybody in Cabot does that. Um, so, but it is a CCIF grant, and it is from that investment fund initiative. It's not a general obligation. Okay, so I, yeah, so that. And also, but you, the weird part is you do end up submitting the invoice to the town. Okay, so I can just submit an invoice, invoice for. Services related to the whatever. And I, do you have a copy of the application? I sent it, but I can send it to you again. Um, I'll dig it up just to make sure it's consistent. And, and, and this is and this is a grant that works by reimbursement, right? So we, we pay yes. money and then they yeah. they they pay us back. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I don't see it. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Send it back. You guys want to resolve that? Did, did we manage to get money out of the? Website? No, I'm still working on that. Okay. Any questions for Becca? How much interest are we getting on that? Like, full round money. <laughs> In this day and age, does it matter? Uh -huh. You just showed all the info we was. <laughs> all right. Um, then, oh, just one more thing. Sorry. Hopefully, um, I've also been working with Alan and um, Charles Schwab to get CD Fiber approved as a place that people can. 
give donor advised funds. So, um, for, how do you want to explain? I mean, it's, it's basically an investment that you have where you, it's, you know, making dividends and all that kind of stuff. It's, an, it's a regular, like, mutual fund or brokerage account. Yeah, what it is is it's a way for an individual to put aside money you actually give to a fiduciary agent, in this case, Charles Schwab, and from those funds, which are usually invested in a range of different mutual funds you can choose, from those funds, you can direct charitable gifts to charitable organizations. It's become especially important because of the changes to the tax law and deductions that came about during the tax during the Trump tax reform, because it's a way of aggregating donations so you can still, at some point, get uh, a big deduction for your charitable gifts. The problem that Beck and I have encountered is CBI is not the usual 501c3 organization that has an IRS letter and all this other stuff that makes us, you know, like the Red Cross or like uh, the Food Bank or whatever. So we've had to prove to Schwab that we are indeed eligible to receive a charitable gift as tax benefit. And it's important to do this because, I, as I mentioned, a lot of people are starting to use these funds. You can give as much, as little as $50. You don't have to have tons and tons of money to do this. Um, but a lot of people are using these. A lot of companies are setting them up. Schwab has one. Fidelity has one. Vanguard has one. It's another way for them to get more money, obviously, into their coffers that they then invest in. Get the and they, the donor can direct where it goes? So yes. the donor can get the tax deduction and say it's for CB5? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's great because whatever you, do, whatever you donate to the fund, you can donate an appreciated stock or mutual fund, and you don't pay capital gains as well as getting the charge. So it, it, it's it's a really good way, it's a good thing to, when we try to raise money from people to mention if they have, happen to have one of these things. What is it called? Yeah. They're, they're usually called charitable uh, funds, charitable gift funds, donor advised funds. I, I think Schwab is something called Schwab Charitable. It's also, it can become very confusing because you will receive a grant from an individual and you have no idea when that the money arrived because it's from Charles Schwab, Schwab or some other entity. You have to connect the dots. Oftentimes there won't be any sort of a warrant letter or anything. It's also a way for wealthy individuals to obscure their philanthropic investments or yeah. hide them entirely. But it's interesting because in the Schwab application, when you apply to make a grant, you are asked if you want your name and address to appear. So someone makes a choice to not to not have it appear. Yeah, the Vermont Community Foundation does the same thing. It's the same thing. So you can have money in the Vermont Community Foundation that's invested and you know grows or doesn't grow. But you can give money without saying who you're who it's coming from. It just comes from the Vermont Community Foundation. Good. So it's still in the pipeline? Yes, so I submitted all the papers that they wanted. Okay. And are, are we going to uh, solicit the Vermont Community Foundation to have you have to evaluate I mean, the fees or what have you to pick one? Well, you, you don't, I think, solicit the Community Foundation. I guess you could, and then they might direct the the, the interest to people who might be interested in things like building out broadband. But usually people identify the number of interest they have for their giving, and if they have a lot of money they give on a yearly basis, you usually are asked to come in if you're a charity and then pitch to them as to why you should get a grant. Well, actually, with the Vermont Community Foundation, they ask people that are sort of members of the mm -hmm. foundation that aggregate, so you can give $500, but it ends up being $50,000 because so many people have sent 
$2,500. So you can ask the Vermont Community Foundation. They have, they have a special format. And so every few months they send out to people that are members of the foundation, hey, we're, we're collecting money for this school or we're collecting money for this thing or the other thing. And, um, that so there is a process. Would that be something worthwhile for us to pursue them too? Yeah, it sounds that way. Yeah. Who's gonna Who's gonna do that? It's all Vermont and, I, and all community. I think before we try and do something else, we ought to make sure we the, can get. You can do it with schwa, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because this has been a difficult process because we don't have the usual paperwork. You know, five hundred one c three. But they have told me when I talk to Schwab that yeah, that should work. They just want to. I, I mean, to their credit, they're doing due diligence to mm -hmm. make sure that we are going to save them. Is it anticipated that we're going to receive money from wealthy individuals because you may have noticed from your taxes this year that your charitable donations literally had no impact on your federal taxes, uh, or regardless? It may have little impact on your Vermont taxes, but it had no impact on your federal taxes. So that just kind of, kind of gone away. So unless it's wealthy people are doing this, what's the point? It, it's not just wealthy people doing this. Well, if they're doing it for tax deduction, Get yeah, they will get it because what you do is every five years you put in, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars. Let's say you give ten thousand dollars a year away to charity, which I, you know, I don't think is unusual in Vermont. Mm -hmm. people all of you, were, all of you were doing it this year. Okay. Well, it's you get you get the tax deduction that year for the fifty thousand, and then you also the money is growing tax-free in the account as well, and you're not paying taxes on that. I mean, it's 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 got about three different angles that are actually add up the same. If Charles Schwab is involved with it, there must be money somewhere. So. <laughs> That's absolutely true. They figured it out. Well, um, I do have a business relationship with Vermont Community Foundation, so I'm willing to talk with them when you say it's the appropriate time. Okay. Yeah, if you want to just, just connect yeah. to make sure that uh, we can yeah, hopefully this will get cleared up in the next month, you know, three weeks, two weeks. So it's always two weeks from now? So. <laughs> it's summer, too, you know, the financial people are sort of in the Hamptons. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Becca. All right, so the next one is um, a formal discussion of the number of towns that we ought to have in the district. We're at 17. We've talked about this and sort of nibbled around the edges and never really come to a consensus. Not, not that we need to, but I thought I would put this on the agenda and make sure that we have a chance to actually say what we think ought to happen. Um, to bring it to speed, um, I previously approached Moortown, and they had said initially no. They wouldn't put it on the, uh, they were gonna put it on the town meeting uh, agenda, town meeting ballot. Um, there was some I heard from some folks in Washington. I've not um, followed up with them. I reached back out to folks in Waterbury. I've not heard back from them. Um, and then there was some suggestion from Duxbury. I've not followed up with them. Um, I reached back out to somebody who I know in Moortown, and I had no idea that they uh, worked for, uh, what was it? Waitsfield Champlain, Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom. I didn't realize that they were systems analysts there. I was like, wow, this is actually fortuitous. I just wanted you to talk to the Moortown Select Board. Um, I'm going to try. I'm trying to set up a meeting with them to see if um, they would support us going to the Select Board again and asking the Select Board to join. I think um, with the expectation that they're building fiber to all the rest of their customers this year. The customers that they have that are not currently connected with fiber that are connected with something else, they will have fiber to the premises at the end of the year. But she explicitly said in the email that there was not going to be 100% um, coverage in uh, Moortown by um, WCVT. Which gives us the opportunity then to make sure that we can cover those, those places that are fairly far out there and can act then as a bridge if we do end up going to Duxbury, Waterbury, Stowe, Elmore, if we, if we go that route. Um, so that's my lay of the land in terms of the number of towns. I'm just wondering if anybody else had any, any thoughts about it. I think more towns we have, the more political support we have. The more political support we have, the greater likelihood we're going to get funding and other kinds of support and uh, go for it. 
Don't worry about us getting to grief um, for a variety of reasons. One of them being that the bigger we are, the more towns get disappointed about being later. Um, the Northeast Kingdom is grappling with the same issue. Um, we discussed it at the, at the summit, which you're going to report on. But um, there's 55 towns in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, there's probably 50 towns in Central Vermont, too. Um, and so they're exploring the idea of having multiple CUDs to, to cover the kingdom. And um, they have, you know, I, I, I sent a map with some possible groupings. I think the best way to do it is to think about what works, what what's contiguous, generally speaking, what kinds of towns ally with each other, um, and keep it manageable. I think you're right that, that more means we have more cloud and possibly more access to money, but more is a much bigger um, pragmatic issue of how to, how to achieve it. So you have to balance those two things. I think also there's, uh, on, on the political side, the more towns you get, the more political clout you can have, but there's a flip side to that, the more political pushback you can get, too. And, uh, you know, this has already been referenced, but to think of it another way, that when, when you start building something out, um, the fewer people involved, the more you know you're meeting what's wanted at that moment. If you're the only person doing it you, and you're building it out for yourself, you know you're going to get what you want. If there's two people in the room, you know you're going to be able to get what you want. But as you go along and you start adding on people, sooner or later you get to the point where either you're watering down what you do to try to keep everybody from not getting angry, or you have a group of people that are angry because they're not getting served as they feel they should get served because you got to start somewhere. Right? And, you know, I, I mean, for instance, this, uh, talking with EC Fiber was a pleasant surprise for me from being in Williamstown because, I, to be honest, I always kind of assumed that with this communications union district that the real greasy wheel, uh, squeaky wheels and uh, Worcester, north of Montpelier. I, I actually thought that the more activist smaller towns would kind of get the first look for a variety of reasons. So. There, there may be tensions that get created from, I mean, even as we are, we're a fairly good-sized region right now. I mean, we go all the way from uh, Northfield and Williamstown in the south, so how far north are we now? Uh, Elmore. Elmore, yeah, we, which is a, geographically, it's a good-sized area. So we might be trying to take on more than we could chew as a single organization, and maybe the approach is to encourage other communication unions districts to form. And it's quite possible that expansion then could happen really quickly because then you'd be going from one communications union district to another as opposed to a town to a town to a town. Um, I, yeah, that, that's it. I, I guess one of my responses to that is can you imagine if we have 25 community, you know, CUDs all competing for a limited amount of money as opposed to some, some giants in the room uh, competing for the money and having a political support to actually get it? And we're going to run into this next year. I mean, it's going to be, it's, that's happening imminently with a limited amount of funds from VITA, which I'm, hope, we're hopefully going to talk about in the open discussion section. But you know, I, I think you're right. My, um, and arbitrarily, I think that like somewhere around 20 is probably the maximum that we want to deal with. So remember, each town gets a delegate, and it makes the meetings longer. Not that I'm, not that it really matters that much. I mean, we have a 17-member board right now, <clears throat> and it, and it works pretty well. But I mean, there is a there is a logical point where it gets a little bit a little bit too much. Um, EC Fiber is 24. We have 17. Um, the ones that were envisioned up in the kingdom, I think. How did she break that down? I, I, I don't have her map in front of me, but there's yeah, like, like I didn't like, it, like, it, like those were and, based on counties instead of. But it was like, like thirty things. and forty, right? Yeah, they were too big. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's a. But there's, there's no population there, so that's part of it. But imagine each town. So imagine Victory send has to send one of its seventy-four residents as a delegate. 
to Northeast Asia. Well, sends one of its three. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well but these, are, these are considerations. These are voting members, and it's interesting. But um, I think we wouldn't want to go bigger than EC Fiber. I mean, EC Fiber will hit all but one of their member towns. And they will finish them up as far as they're, they're planning to within the next couple of years. Um, I would suggest that we shouldn't go larger than 23. And I, and I would even put, put out, I'll tell you the six towns I think that if we're going to add any more, that these are what should, we should consider just for kind of geographical compactness uh, so, so that we aren't sort of gerrymandering our district. Um, Washington, Stowe, Waterbury, Duxbury, Moortown, and Morristown. And I'm thinking in particular of Stowe and Morristown, really so that we can get Elmore. Elmore, they were, Elmore representatives aren't here today, but they were um, as eager as anyone else and here right from the beginning. And if we're not running fiber up through Stowe and Morristown, there's a big chunk of Elmore that's just not going to be served. And yes, we can run things, uh, we can run fiber through those towns uh, to get to Elmore, but it almost seems silly. But don't do forget, so. don't forget the Velcro pop up theory. That works. That's true. To pop back up the road. That, that bread is already built. You don't have to build it. They don't have to pay for it. We just pay for the transport. And, and it's what? There's a, a drop in Morristown, is it? Every substation. They're all over the place. Yeah. No, I, I, but I think the next substation closest to Elmore would be Morristown. Really? Yeah. I would suggest that enrolling the, the uh, politicians from the towns that represent the towns that, that if you want your town to be picked, you need to step up. And, and that's not a guarantee, mm -hmm. but I don't see many politicians to stay. I mean, Becca Allen is the most visible, but other than that, I don't see that they're all saying, uh, you know, if it comes up in a bill, we'll vote on it. But other than that, I don't see them giving me any support. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of stuff being spearheaded up in the Northeast Kingdom and in southern Vermont, down by uh, Dover, Brattleboro area. Um, there is going to be another communications union district likely being spun up down there, too. Uh, probably will look different from EC Fiber. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but do we do kind of one last reach out? <clears throat> and by the we, I mean me. Um, do I reach out to Washington? Do I reach out to these six towns and say, here we go. I mean, it's the, the door is open. Time. <laughs> yeah, but really, I mean, before we start construction, because then we, I mean, statute says that we can charge them to join after that, after we've actually started doing things. But we don't have to. Well, we don't have to. We don't have to. But it, but it sort of seems like they can wait and see how things go. I'm, I'm sort of inclined to saying, let them come to us. Why do we have to recruit them? If they want to join us and they get excited, cool. But otherwise. Why are we looking for more? Because I, I, I essentially want to establish the district and not really have to think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. This that we've decided now, and we can always change our minds later. That's how yeah. boards work. But we can say, here is what we are. Here's how we are expecting to um, project out the next ten years, and we can reasonably think about that. Whereas, you know, if we're some, in year four of our ten-year plan, and somebody says, "Oh, can I come too?" Then we sort of require kind of rejiggering of the strategic plan. And I would like to be able to say, we've got 21 towns, and we're going forward. Jeremy, could I propose that you draft a letter that you would submit to these town select boards, so that's sort of a template, if you will, that can be, that we can review and approve at the next meeting. <laughs> so that, that would be our, you know, offering them a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, I don't know window in order to approach us. I think that would be appropriate. Well, I'll address anything. I have another development to bring up, which is towns that already have service. And, and so towns that don't would be really resentful. You know, you build in a town that already has service. So it's just something to think about. And coming from Worcester, I can imagine where that would be a concern. Uh, to me, is that you know we're all invested in this as individuals, and and we're here representing the town that we live in. 
And so it, it really isn't a they, it's a he or a she in the, in the mm -hmm. towns that are... No, but this, I, I didn't see until saw this. In the towns that aren't involved. It's not, it's not the town, it's an individual in the town that's going to make the, the case for the town to join. And so you can't say, well, you know, Stowe doesn't want to join. It's like, well, the person in Stowe that would get Stowe to join hasn't been approached yet, rather than, you know, we went to the select board and the select board said no. It's because us coming to the select board and saying, you know, but, but who are we and what are we really are offering? Whereas if, it's, if there's an individual or five or six individuals in Stowe that go to their board and say, Right. So, so it, it isn't like the town isn't interested. They haven't, they haven't got that person mm -hmm. or those people. So I think, you know, you were talking about Front Porch Forum. You know, putting information on Front Porch Forum in Stowe and Waterbury, Duxbury, whatever, and saying, you know, this is what these towns are doing. Maybe you guys want to get your town involved too. And yeah. We, you know, I mean, and the way I started this out is I, you know, I reached out to people I already knew, right. and then I started sending email messages to, um, very much like like what um, what John's suggesting is that you know I, I wrote letters, I, I really wrote emails, and I said I'm happy to come and talk to you, mm -hmm. and basically everybody put me on their agendas, and some of the places that didn't, I just showed up and talked about it, gave my pitch, and had the same presentation, explained it, and. It was generally well received, and they're like, so what, what's the drawback? That was what I was always asking them to. Uh, not really much. You have to go to meetings. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one person from your time is good meetings. Jeremy, you had something? Yeah, I mean, one has thought about if you send out a whole bunch of letters all at once, what if you get, you know, the one town that's kind of islanded, not connected to anything else, and then the other five say no, and then you've got this one town that said yes. I don't know if that's a concern. I don't the geography. We still have to go to the yeah, that's, that's yeah. true. Yeah, but on the other hand, if, if you invite them and then they say, yes, we'd like to, and then we come back and say, well, no, you can't join, that's just going to mess them off. Yeah, so, there, there's only one town that, that would be in that in that boat, that would be Duxbury. And that, so okay. neither Waterbury nor Moore Town decided to, to come on board, and then they would be an island, and that would mm -hmm. be kind of sad. And then, but we could probably talk to the folks in Duxbury and have them, you know, exert some pressure. Mm -hmm. on their neighbors to make sure things might Okay, I just wanted to explain what I did a moment ago. I, I brought a picture over to Jeremy to see because um, I was toying with the idea of natural CUDs on the map of northern Vermont. And I know of certain towns that have affinities and certain geography. And one of the CUDs I came up with, and these are just speculation, but one of them that I came up with included Waterbury and Stowe and Morrisville belonging not to us, but belonging to a northern one, going up the spine of the, the Greens into Montgomery and Jay, because they, they sort of go together. And I don't know if they think that. It was just, I, I went to a meeting in Montgomery that begged me to come over there, and I said, no way. But th there was a lot of interest in Montgomery, and, and they're a, a growing town because of Jay. And, um, so Jay and Montgomery and Stowe and Waterbury and Morrisville are there. So, so you actually had us taking Waterbury? I, I, I think because we've been talking about them. Oh, right? okay. But I'm, I'm still saying, what I'm saying is these, these towns that we might consider recruiting may belong better with another group. And so it's, you know, as this sort of sugars out, there are going to be CUDs everywhere at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess what I'm asking everybody is, you know, what's your what's your preference? Are we are we good? And do we just say, let's let's move on? Let's consider, you know, the 17 that we have our, in our strategic plan. I think 23 is a good number. I'm fine with 23. Mm -hmm. it sounds fine. I think it's doable. It's more bodies to be on committees. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Um, the uh, the towns that we're looking at, Waterbury, Stowe, Morristown. What was the other one that you mentioned? Up oh, Jay Montgomery into Jay. We're not talking about those. Though. Oh no. Um, they got money, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they've got people there who are who have invested in their towns who are frustrated at the relatively low tech level available to them in those areas, but they're still invested in those areas. 
which could be a benefit on a larger scale. I sound a mercenary, and I realize that, but it, it's it's. Um, When you were saying Waterbury, Stowe, Montgomery, I'm picturing all of the gold money going up with all of the gold money and hanging out there and not being any benefit to any of the other communities. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm coming from on that. And and it just seems like this is the opportunity. It's it's there's no buy-in for them. They just have to say, yeah, we'll do this, and then the work will happen. And because it doesn't matter what CUD they join, it's not, not likely to happen any faster for them than it would with any other CUD. I'm not sure about that point. Well, the rest of it, I'm with you. It, they throw enough money at it, they'll get whatever they want. But <laughs> I'm going to go back to just there's different characteristics to the town based on the listing of service or not, and also income and density and, and some other things. I guess I'm a little curious as to why they haven't decided to do anything up to this point. Um, we're pretty well known, especially that you've reached out already to two, and so it's been moved. Yeah, so, well, so well, 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 whatever you reached out to me, and there was somebody from a co-working space, there was somebody from their planning commission, and there was somebody from Duxbury okay. Development okay. Organization, too. But I haven't talked to the select board in Waterbury. I haven't talked to the select board in Duxbury. Duxbury. You never talked to the CAB select board. Like, I mean, I guess right. if coming back to that model, if there's somebody in the, it's not that difficult of a process yeah. to say if you're motivated for your town to say, hey, we really want to call this, put it on the agenda, let's talk about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Drive it. So I guess I'm just, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm a little bit more like wait and see. Like, if people are motivated to join, they'll do it. And it's not like we're hiding here, um, you know. And, I don't know. So but but Jeremy is saying he doesn't want four years to pass. and that, So maybe it's some kind of deadline. Maybe we play wait and see for a year or so. Right. Mm -hmm. But not a long well, time. Maybe we say by, by, by the end of this year or, or sooner that we <clears throat> really are going to put a, you know, a, a kind of a soft cap at this point on the number of towns that we have. I mean, it would be nice to have Washington, for example. I mean, because uh, otherwise they're sort of carved out. And, the, and I have had people, a uh, state, state rep from Washington, reach out to me. I haven't, made, I haven't talked to him in a year. But I don't know that he went to the Washington Select Board and, and did anything. So. I think another point to consider is, is local, other local providers such as Stowe Cable or Transvideo that they're in the community, and then you're saying, well, we're coming in the community, well, they're gonna fight back. And, you know, and so, is it realistic to be, I mean, nobody's gonna object at all if you take on Comcast, right? but you know, taking on the local company, and people will be asking why. You know, and you, I don't think we'd get the take rate in these towns that already have a local provider. Uh, and so, in the instance of Stowe, you may be able to cut a deal to lease fibers to get through town because your goal is to get to Elmore. Mm -hmm. But why bother taking on Stowe Cable? But Stowe Cable doesn't doesn't provide service to 100% of Stowe residents. That's no true. Provider, but, they, but the ones that they don't provide are uneconomical for them, and you've got to go through them to get to the periphery of the towns. Mm -hmm. And so they become really expensive. And so it, it, it really negatively impacts the, the economics of trying to get the whole thing off the ground. You're saying, well, we're trying to serve these people that are on the periphery and encourage Stowe Cable, like, go get those people. They're yours. <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, to speak to I mean, some of that, as well as getting a potentially a little bit longer deadline for them to hit, um, we back to where we landed at last time we had these kind of discussions, was, are we going to wait till there's a feasibility study and look at you know an actual informed decision here, rather than just arbitrarily saying we're going to select these towns or not and cut a number here. Um, I don't know where we're at on feasibility study in the long, short term range of things, but um, it seems like that would be the better choice making method than what we come up with in this room tonight. Well, but it would also be nice that once we're ready to pull the trigger on a feasibility study, that if we have other towns 
that need to be part of that, we should be doing that feasibility study and say, oh, actually, the best place for us to start is this, is this group, that, this town that just joined. But if they're not at the table when we do the feasibility study, then we can't possibly accommodate them. I mean, does it make sense for us to do our feasibility study and include Washington if they haven't been added? I, I think some towns make more sense than others. Washington really makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's maroon by AC5 maroon. Yeah. It's, it, it needs to be in one or the other. Um, I mean, we're telling them what they need, but maybe they don't want that. But yes. if they if they want to be in something, they should come to us. That makes sense. Stowe, I'm not so sure about. Waterbury, I'm not so sure about. The motivation to get to Elmore seems to me we can get to Elmore lots of ways. Okay. I can tell you nobody's been successful in building through Stowe because it's Stowe Electric and Stowe Cable, and they're in cahoots. They, they kept everybody out. Comcast didn't, didn't get in. No, nobody got in. So the likelihood of in this CB fiber getting through is not very high. Well, maybe we could work with that. Yes. But that's what I'm saying. You say, oh, we're happy to lease fiber from you to get from one side of town to the other, and we'll leave you alone. Sure. And, and those same conversations should be had with you know, Transvideo and Northfield right. when we do our you know, proper projects. Right. So what's your takeaway on this, Jeremy? Um, that there's not a consensus. Um, I, it's, it seems like everybody's, I don't say in agreement necessarily, but that 20-ish is not crazy, um, and, but I'm not hearing like a lot of eagerness, you know, to rush out and recruit a lot more. So we try to just recruit Washington to yeah. start. That's yeah. simple. As so, fun. so, so I'm I'm having the conversation with with more to actually not not more town, but the folks at WCBT, okay. and they um, very very initially seemed receptive to talking to us, to them and Washington. And then maybe we just say, okay. And if somebody comes to us later, we cross that bridge and we get there. That seemed reasonable. Well, it was also too brought up about uh, having a deadline. Let these towns know, you know, X months from now, this is it. You're either you come in or you don't. But mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's, and that's true. On, on the other hand, you know, we've been in the news enough we're out there. Folks should know by now. I mean, Andy, you you know you you got the news right away, and you're like, nope, nope, we're in on this too. It's like, do not leave us behind. And so, really jumped on that. And um, yeah, folks aren't at a certain level willing to kind of put some of their own motivation into it. Do we, you know, just kind of drag them along? But so, do do I send out messages to the other? I think, towns. I think you push Washington the same way you push Worcester. Worcester finally did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they were a natural, even though it was the last cloud in Lions Town. <laughs> um, but they fit. Mm -hmm. And Washington fits. And so I think you should give a little extra push to them. Okay. And Dexbury, it's, it's up to them. Yeah. I wouldn't push them. And I wouldn't push Waterbury or Stone. Okay. Or, or, or Morristown. Or if, if they're primarily covered. Yeah, and they're mostly to covered by Telecom. Champlain. They're going to build out more. It seems like, as a business case, it, it leaves the hot the stuff that they don't want to yeah. serve. It's the expensive mm -hmm. stuff. So my sense is, yeah. But on the other hand, there's there's um, residences in, in Berlin and Middlesex and Northfield that are hard to reach yeah. without having those outlying re places okay. in more time anyways. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be the super, super sparse neighborhoods. But if we're running out far northwest Northfield or far west Berlin, um, there's some residences right, right across the border yeah, that we yeah. can reach that way. But I wouldn't close the door. I wouldn't say a year from now, if you're not in, to hell with you. I just leave the door open. Sure. We don't know that we might not need uh, their support mm -hmm. in, in getting you know, some political advantage in getting funds or having them form their own CDs or something. So, um, Proceed with a couple of three you talked about and uh, just leave the door so publicity will either bring them to us mm -hmm. or not. Well, the publicity we've gotten to this point hasn't gotten them. I'm not, I'm not sure what else. So, so I, but I'm hearing more town in Washington. Yeah. Okay. Matt, my thing, if Washington's at all like Orange, 
it, it's going to take somebody like me who's got a real passion for this to get them going. And it, that person, it I wouldn't like be surprised. If, pardon? <laughs> it is like orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's, well, that's what I was thinking. And, and like I said, they're, they're, they're state rep oh, down there. Um, he, he has expressed an, an interest in the past of going and um, driving this. So if I go and he goes, we can both go to a select board meeting and hopefully. I was going to suggest that I would be willing to do it. Oh, great. So yeah, we'll, we'll bring you along too. It'll probably be a shorter drive for you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that would put us at 19. And then the question mark on whether we get any bigger, but it's, I mean, that's always the board's decision. I mean, any policy that we adopt, of course, we can later say, oh, what were we thinking? Okay. So, just for the record, consensus was to reach out specifically to um, Washington, Moortown. Washington, Moortown. Okay. And <coughs> then not necessarily set a deadline to close the door for anybody else. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to burn through this next one quickly. Um, if you have questions about it, that's fine. Uh, I did send out an email earlier today about this. So, uh, H 513, uh, the bill was uh, the bill passed. It was signed by the governor uh, a couple weeks ago. I went down to the signing at the Dover uh, Town Hall. Uh, it was reasonably well attended, and everybody was pretty excited about all of that. Um, the Northeast Kingdom Broadband Summit, that was up in was that in the bill? Mm -hmm. um, and that brought a whole bunch of people together who were interested in building communications union districts in Northeast Kingdom. Um, it turns out that Linden already did, they did their feasibility study, and their feasibility study says, yeah, things look good, build a communications union district. So we're kind of going at things in slightly a reverse sort of way. They, they did the reverse of what we were recommending doing. They, they went out and did a feasibility study they could have done for themselves. And they still don't have a business model. Yeah. And we're, we're going to not waste our money on that. Because we, 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 we know we want this. Yeah. So, we just, so we're going to build a business model so we can go for grants. They got, they got a lot more. They applied for and got a lot more USDA growth development money than we, have, than we asked for. It's like, what, sixty seventy thousand dollars they got? Right. And they did their feasibility study. So there's a uh, Evan Carlson's report about that was in the email that I sent you, uh, or a link to it was sent to you uh, earlier today. Um, that was a, that was a really good meeting, I thought, um, because it showed that there's a lot of folks thinking about things in similar ways as we're thinking down here. Maybe not as far along as as us. I just I, the people that I talked to there, you know, like contacts with select boards or select boards say just. Put it on the agenda. Just move it forward. <laughs> it's like let you know, create create the thing, and then you'll be able to start start going forward. Um, I got a chance though to talk briefly to some folks at Vida, who are the folks who would be uh, hopefully offering us the up to four million dollar loan to do construction. And uh, they're like, yeah, we don't really know much about this at all. So that's why we're here. Um, so they're going to be spending several months ramping up and trying to understand what it is that they're turning over millions of dollars to do. Um, so they, they, they seem to, a little bit, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but seem a little bit scared about the prospect. Like they didn't know like the risk exposure and such, um, but confident that they could. They seem very scared. <laughs> but I, I would point out some of that is in Vita's history. They did make loans for broadband. Yeah, these people, highest, people didn't even know that. I told them about it. It was their highest area of default, was loans for broadband. But this is going back 15 years. Yeah. Who was that? Someone who lives in Northfield who would be very well served by uh, high speed internet, well, there's DSL right now. Um, her last name is Denny. I don't remember her first name. Um, and then the director, the director of the loan program, he was there. And then I uh, also talked to who's the head of ACCD? She was there. Joan Goldstein. Yeah. 
um, talked to her and said, you know, thanks for the thing for my innovation grant. Like, the insurance requirements for that are kind of weird for us, though. I said, because we're going to end up spending $2,500 on a $12,500 grant. I don't really think that's probably what you were intending. She's like, hmm, interesting. And a day later, or two days later, I got an email from her office saying, Joan just talked to me <laughs> about that insurance thing. There is a waiver process. <laughs> oh, waiver process. Okay. Which I was, which I was like, oh, that would have been nice to know months ago. Um, there's a waiver process whereby we can say the insurance part here, here, and here doesn't apply to our project. So like the car thing, which we talked about, doesn't apply to our project. We can explicitly ask to say. This is not going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. And we can apply, give the justification, and they can come back and say yes or no. Um, so I passed that along to Josh, who's been um, sort of collecting and getting all sorts of information together about the various uh, insurance quotes. And uh, he is not here tonight. He got shifted to a slightly different schedule, so he won't be reporting back on that. Um, this is sort of my progress on insurance report back for you there too. But that that was that meeting was good for a number of reasons, main uh, in large part because we learned of that um, insurance waiver process. So we'll hopefully hear by next month um, if we can waive those and whatever we can't waive, um, will, it will hopefully be a cheaper insurance package. Anything else from that you think was uh, interesting? I thought the keynote presentation from the NTIA guy that came from Washington. It's not like um, NTIA is. Uh, that's the Department of Commerce. National. I don't know what it stands for. Oh, oh but, okay. <laughs> Department, Department of Commerce. He's a federal guy. National Telecommunications yeah. uh, Information uh, Agency yeah. or something like that. Yeah. They're in, they and USDA were in charge of all the stimulus grants. Um, and, he did kind of a boilerplate um, presentation, but there were so many nuggets of useful information in his boilerplate that I, I was very impressed. And um, you can look at, there was, what was his name, Don something? You should look at that presentation and, and, and look for all the different ways you can get money. Um, and there's, and they have a website called Broadband something, Broadband USA or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it lists every possible federal program that can bring in broadband money. There's some weird ones, mm -hmm. and they're worth pursuing, except for the ones that are all about Native Americans, because um, we don't have any reservations here. But but there's a lot of interesting kinds of grants you can get from transportation and libraries and all, medicine and all kinds of things. Um, so that was useful. Um, and they're kind of starting, the kingdom is starting something that's like an umbrella for CUDs. They're not gonna, they're not trying to do one CUD, but they're trying to um, stir up, stir everybody up and get them to form things. And they've got a plan to make it happen because um, the umbrella organization in Northeast Kingdom Collaborative is now scheduling organizing meetings, and I'm going to one next Wednesday, and they're going to make it happen. Just just the way Jeremy got this thing started, just the way um, Tim Nolte got things started in EC Fiber way back when. Spurgeon's on his name, but um, I so I think good things are going to come from there. I think it's a really good idea for us to to keep tabs of the other CUDs because. We can teach them, they, we, they can teach us even if they're newer. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to come up with some ideas we didn't think of. Or maybe we thought of it, but we didn't know it would be so lucrative or whatever. So I think communicating with all these organizations as they grow, I think, would be useful too. I and mean, folks up in Linden, I mean, already did a survey. And that survey, I mean, they would share that with us, for example. Yeah. I mean, our, ours is probably going to be a little bit different. We've already done a lot of work on it. But yeah. that, things like that, I think. Yeah. Linden's a real special case because they're a, it's a very served town. They're like 80, 80, 85% served. And oh my God, we have nothing here. We need to have <laughs> And 
And so, and to justify what they're doing, they're tacking on some poor towns around them to make a CUD so they can get the rest of Linden covered. So it's an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. That's that, it's okay. I mean, the, the the final goal that they will hopefully reach will be Linden gets covered 100, percent but then everybody else around them too. Yeah. Okay, um, move on to progress on insurance, and we'll just strike that one. Josh is not here. We'll hope for, I'll put that on the next one. Do we need to send any motion here about actually doing a waiver and getting that done? Or um, I guess we, if you want to like explicitly authorize me to apply, like me or Josh to apply for a waiver with uh, ECCD, I'd be happy to have that kind of belt and suspenders. Okay, so we have a we have a motion to authorize me or Josh to apply for an insurance waiver with ACCD, and that was seconded by Phil. Any further discussion? Wow, talkative. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Motion passes. Thanks for that. Um, okay. We did the Business Development Committee report back already. Uh, initial survey results, I don't think David has actually compiled any of those. I think we're still waiting on um, his next round, so we'll strike that one as well. Uh, Phil. Can, can I just say that it's pretty revealing that we only got 21 responses, that, that we're going to have to look at some other ways besides front porch form to get surveys. And that's, that's why it's good he's doing a pilot, because it helps us understand that process. That's because people that don't have broadband can't possibly get any <laughs> There's that. There's that. But, but there's there's many hundreds on the Calus front porch forum and only 21 answers. Yeah. So either the survey was too tedious and long or they don't care or it's just not the way to reach people. Or they didn't notice. Yeah. Everybody's on vacation. So, so. I will say one thing. I remember years ago I did an in-town survey in Williamstown about uh, asking people's attitudes. I had a bunch of questions about school district merger or things that were going to that people wanted to see out of the school district, and you know those things are notoriously poor for getting results. So what I did, I went around and I forget now. I got like ten different prizes, so that if you filled out the survey and left your name and a contact that you would get put in for one of the possible prizes. And for a fairly mundane, well, I won't say mundane, but a boring survey, is I ended up with over 100 responses. Wow, well, you're a good idea. idea. So, I, I mean, it's so simple. But it's I, that really helped. Hmm. That's what Volvo does with their surveys. They offer you 100 bucks. You, you can win $100 if you put in your name, address, phone number, et cetera. So. Yeah, I see a lot with like uh, even academic surveys offer like a hundred dollar Amazon gift card yeah. if you're chosen. Right, oh, that's an easy thing. Gift card, or gift card. Yeah, Amazon. And I, I would say quite comfortable. Well, not only can you check the addresses that are different, but I even went back and cross referenced the responses on the surveys, and there was no indication that people were stacking the survey, you know, <laughs> just to get in. Right. Everything looked like you know there were different responses from survey to survey. So good. Good idea. I know we just had the 4th of July and stuff, but there are still a bajillion fairs and festivals this summer. If people wanted to set up a table at a fair or a festival, we should get a lot of survey results that way too. So, yeah, so when, when we're ready with a paper copy of the survey, yeah. you can uh, get out those. Or an iPad way. Yeah, uh, if you got that ready to go. It was like my first job I did phone surveys. It was probably <laughs> farmers in Indiana about their bull <laughs> no, no, this was, I was living in Iowa. Okay. That's why well, what he gave is the, is the, na the national. Yeah, um, no, this is a little two guy company in, in Iowa. Okay. Good, good to know. <laughs> I like doing surveys. Is there any other social media forum that we can use that doesn't open it to too broad an audience? From Porch Forum, you can do targeted ads on Facebook and other um, other social media too. You could do um, Google AdWords targeted at certain geographic areas. Um, you could do radio ads, um, which are not terribly expensive. Newspaper ads. 
some money. I mean, it, it would depend on how much we wanted to spend on marketing. Facebook ads would be a reasonably cheap, lo low hit rate. From Forge Forum, I think we can do it for free. Um, radio ads would be a couple hundred dollars. I think we're asking you to do a survey, but like a Facebook ad, right? Put the survey right in front of them. Sure. Than a radio one. Where you can sure. But well, but, but on, the, on the other hand, drumming up interest with, for people who don't otherwise yeah. use yeah. Facebook. Get a purpose of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and getting at those people who are listening to the radio in their house who are not using social media, or maybe you know they can call a number I mean, and have we can ma mail something to them. I think the front porch forum is probably the best advertising we need to have. Um, it just may not be the best way to get surveys. Um, now we're a for-profit, so we don't get free free ads, but um, they looked kindly on what we're doing, and they have a, a category. I, I complained. I said I don't want to. They they have they have one front porch forum for most of the Northeast Kingdom, so fifty something towns, and I didn't want to advertise to fifty towns and get all these people signing up. I said I really want to just do one town. Oh, we don't do that for ads, sorry. But then a day later, they got back to me and they said, but we do that for candidates for public office. But they're called paid postings instead of ads. And we've talked it over and we've decided that you qualify. Huh? Okay. So I got paid postings just to one town and they were very reasonable and they were longer than an ad too. So that I think that's what they're gonna to extend to us for free. Well, I mean, I, I think I may be able to just make a regular posting, like a state senator who covers all of Washington County and posts the entire county. Right. I think I can post to the entire county plus, mm -hmm. but mine is the other parts of the county. If you can take the towns you want yeah. and leave out the ones you don't, mm -hmm. whereas the ads, you can't. They're, they're, they come in groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so hopefully we'll, 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 I mean, once we're ready to pull the trigger on that, we'll, we'll be able to do that. But. I think David will hopefully give us some more information about what he's finding in Dallas. Let's go from there. Um, Phil? Okay. Um, policy on grants. Uh, I only heard back from John, uh, who gave me extensive uh, suggestions. So the, uh, the version that you have uh, steals liberally from uh, his comments. It was sent out to you earlier today, so let me ask the first question. Did anyone read it? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's success. Because I was going to say, I really don't want to sit here and read this to you, and I didn't, didn't make copies. Um, did I hit the points that, that you had? I, I think you did. I found it to be the language to be clear and for the grant policy to be quite flexible. OK. Um, so it basically, I took away the the, uh, the tiers. Everything needs approval except for the less than 1,000, which, as we said, we're considering more to be a, a donation. I added language that uh, talks about in-kind um, grants, again, at your suggestion, so that it, we can go uh, either way. There was something also, let me see, um, oh, uh, and again, this is like ongoing monitoring. The, the transparency that documents will be uh, posted on our website, uh, including any kind of uh, reporting that we have to do or monitoring that we have to do. Um, the, the chair uh, will designate an individual or committee to track and report back on each of the grants. So as we do find things that we're interested in, if they get awarded, we decide to accept them. It'll be up to Jeremy to ask certain ones of us or a committee to, well, so it's kind of be the, the uh, oversight person or committee to uh, to follow that grant uh, and to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's crossed. Um, again, I said, you know, if there's uh, award letters uh, or conditions of the grant, again, that, those would be posted also. I could skip over that one. And all, all grant agreements would be signed by the chair uh, after review by the full, full, full board and a vote to accept the conditions of the award. I, I think I got it. I would add the word uh, right the way you read it out loud, and a vote, because 
Otherwise, I, I first read that wrong. Which which item are you? Last asking? very last line. Six. Right after the word and, add a, add the word a. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, one thing to note on this is sometime um, there are grants that are sometimes uh, time sensitive when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, grant agreements and uh, award conditions and such. If we adopt this, which I which I generally uh, agree with. We'll, we will almost certainly have to schedule special meetings to approve um, grant agreements, just, just so you know. And our special agreement, uh, special meetings are not by uh, mm -hmm. phone, on wild. Yeah, so, so, we would so it would have to be held somewhere, but yeah, any of these meetings can always be attended by phone. You just need to give me or somebody else <coughs> enough advance warning so that we can make sure that we patch you in. So, number six says all grant agreements shall be signed by the chance board. Um, I would see that possible conflict, the differentiation between under a thousand and over a thousand. Do we want to, like, do we still have to have sign off for under a thousand dollar grants? And yeah, because because they may have conditions that the board doesn't really want to meet. Even though it's actually good, yeah. So it's not worth five hundred dollars if it costs yeah, five thousand dollars. Right. right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is there, is there anything in here that leaves out at you as uncomfortable? Are you, I mean, are you ready to vote on it? Or do you want to chew on this for another month and adopt it then? Right. Okay. So I, I would like to read the entire policy. It's, it's, it's short enough, but I want to make sure that you know what, what you're voting on. Um, okay. So the grant application policy. Whereas CB Fiber may wish to apply for monetary or in-kind grants as opportunities arise, number one, any board or committee member may apply for an appropriate grant on behalf of the Central Vermont Fiber, Fiber Board within the limitations set forth below. All grants except for those less than $1,000 or have an in-kind value less than $1,000 require the approval of the full board prior to submission. Number three, grants under $1,000 are largely considered donations and members do not require prior approval to apply. However, the individual or committee should inform the chair of their intent to apply for said grant. Four, the chair shall designate an individual or committee to track and report on each of the grants. Five, grant submissions, award letters, etc., shall be posted to the CB Fiber website. Periodic reports and progress monitoring shall also be posted to the website. Six, all grant agreements shall be signed by the chair after review by the full board and a vote to accept the conditions of the award. So I move that we adopt this policy as presented. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Motion passes. Thank you. So we are under that, that policy now. <laughs> Um, we should print out a copy of that and sign that maybe next time around. Sure. If you bring one of those, that would be yeah. terrific. Who do those document submissions go to? Document submissions? You're going to put it up on the website. So. I have um, a grant for BESC. For now, it would go, should go to Jared. Just like I, I have um, minutes and agendas, mostly, mostly agendas that I need to get to Jared. Um, I think I have most of the minutes you have, whichever ones I don't. Okay, um, open discussion. So this is where we um, look at what we want to do for the next year. Uh, we have an upcoming annual report to put together that we have to have in front of the select boards. Someone help me out, like October? And we ha will have to have a draft budget for their consideration about that time as well. They then give us their feedback. We bring it back here, take their feedback, maybe adjust the budget, and then we adopt a budget for the next year. Um, we should also, maybe at the next meeting, um, um, look at our, our budget status from what we did, um, from what we adopted last year, and what we actually ended up with this year. Um, so our next steps, um, what we need to put in the budget, an upcoming end report. I think this is going to be, some of those things are going to be specific call-outs in future meetings, but um, I want to restate the 
vision that I had with the with, with the, the Vita loans and how we were approached by um, Valinet. Um, I have not talked to Valinet again to, with any sort of you know, uh, effort to firm things up or actually get contracts in front of us or anything. That's something I intend to do soon. Um, but what I'm imagining, given um, the $4 million possibility for next year, is that Roxbury, Northfield, Williamstown, potentially Washington, could be part of a first construction next year if everything lines up and the Vita money comes through. And that could extend farther. I, I, I don't know. I would have to look at the at the, the road mileage. I have not looked at that again. Look at the road mileage and see how much of those towns, all of those towns, would get covered by $4 million. So in terms of which towns are coming on later or whatever, I'm sort of envisioning long-term us starting from the south, sort of gradually moving north. Probably initially, sorry, Montpelier, Berry City, Berry Town, probably initially kind of going around them and then maybe at some point building back in. That's my, that's my vision. What's that? Yeah, it's sort of just like, like, like mold spreading, right? Slowly. Pac-Man's so, friendly. So no. has Vita released the terms of their loans? No, they're, they're, they're still working on how they can comply with uh, with H513 that just passed. Um, I was going to schedule a meeting with them to see if there's any sort of information that I can provide about what we're going to be looking for or if there's things that they are going to be looking for um, that we're going to be looking for that they can provide and, and vice versa, basically just making sure that they know that we're interested and if there's anything that we need to get in line even before they know what those terms are. Um, well, the, and the payback schedule mm -hmm. is going to be important to us. And so how do we take a payback schedule and define that in terms of customers and, and this goes into the adoption rate and having towns compete, like enough people in this was, was there a term in the sign on, we'll do it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in, it's in, what EC fiber yeah, this, it's the, in the legislation. The, the, the statute says how the how some of that's supposed to work. Vita hasn't sort of kind of dealt with the um, fine details. Let, let me see if I can find um, there's zero payments in the first two years. Yeah. Unless you want to. Mm -hmm. No principal, no interest for two years. And I think it was 20 years, it was at least 10. Yeah, hold on. It's pretty favorable. No, it was, it was the payments need to be made. Yeah, when they were going to do a start. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that I think that they were hoping to um, hoping to do is because we can't go for the municipal uh, bonds, the revenue bonds, for at least three years. What they wanted to do is make sure that we had a chance to get some revenues, especially if we don't have to pay, essentially start paying the thing back. We can start we build the thing. It gives us a bit of a gap. Start turning people on. And then start getting those revenues in anticipation of then paying them back over the 15 or 20 years. Um, um, and the statute says, uh, yeah, we realize that these are high risk. I think that's a nod to the previous uh, uh, problems. Um, amounts up to $4 million. Eligible borrowers alone shall not exceed 90% of projected costs. Interest and principal may be deferred up to two years. Um, what we have to provide to do it um, and their reporting requirements. The interest is just deferred. The interest and principal would be deferred. Right. So, the so it's accruing. It's accruing. Of course. Mm -hmm. So they, though you said 90% the VIA grant would, or loan rather, would, would no more than 90% of the cost of the project. Mm -hmm. So if you got... What's the interest in if you got a million dollar loan, for instance, that would mean we'd be on the hook for at least coming up with a hundred thousand. Yeah. But but those could be in kind contribution as well. Contributions as well. That would be something we need to work out with with ValleyNet because I think there are some um, 
engineering and contracting things that they can provide that would more than make up for you know, that, that difference. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my instinct about that. I, I, I don't know how well that would be. And why would they give us that? Because they said that they would. All right. Why I can tell you. Why would they? I can teach half the people in this room how to do that. Yeah. It's not hard. Okay. The engineering. Yes. Yeah. So, what, so why would they do that? Be, because they want to be the operator. Yeah. So they're gonna make, they're gonna get it somehow. They they they're not to do. All right. Well, regardless, the idea is that we have to come up with that ten percent. So, yes. yeah. so, 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 so Obama writes us a check for 400 grand and we go from there and we there go on value or something, right? Like. Okay, I wanted, I wanted to make another point. Um, Craftsbury just built out, got federal grants, and did a basically half a million dollar project and covered half the population, a quarter of the roads. To do to do the whole town of Craftsbury would have cost about two million. So when we're talking about four million doing four towns, it's probably not real. Okay. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, I, again, I, I would have to look at the mileage of Craftsbury versus the mileage I of... I think it's <coughs> pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Okay, so maybe it's only gonna be two towns. Or one. <coughs> two well, towns yeah, or two. Yeah, probably two. Two or parts of four. Right. <laughs> Doesn't it lead to like I mean, various scenarios of how we could build out, and we start judging those as far as like do we build like a mold that slowly grows in a direction, or <laughs> like a tree that has a single shoot that goes through and then spreads out? <laughs> like, right. Holes. Well, and, and and one of the reasons that we would start in the south is because there is existing infrastructure that ValleyNet has um, adjoining Roxbury and Williamstown, mm -hmm. so it's already there. So building from there makes a certain amount of sense. Not that we're necessarily constrained to do that. I mean, you know, like you said, the like the, the Velco middle mile could be used too, and we could start up in, you know, um, start up in the northwestern corner. We could start, or wherever. You could do Elmore and Roxbury as your first project. Yes, that's that's true. Because um, of Velco. Right. If the substations are in the right place. Um, yeah, I'm, anyways. Okay. Um, but yeah, so but th this is why I'm bringing this here, hoping that everybody understands what I'm picturing. And if you're picturing something different, or if there's something that we need to be thinking about or doing, then let's get that let's get that out so that we can. Well, I I would suggest that this is that if you get the, the time to define the criteria for which towns. So, uh, and and are you thinking that? The uh, feasibility study is going to provide that, or or not. So, but what are the criteria uh, for building in any particular town? ValleyNet has explicitly come to us and said towns contiguous to their to existing networks. Right. So there's an incentive to start there. Right. I think understanding what the um, feasibility study is going to show us will will show us those towns, but I think they will also show us the rest of the picture too. We will eventually want to build part two. We will eventually want to expand without the benefit of $4 million deal on that. So, so if they can uh, connect and operate? I think for, for this first project, that's, that's, my, that's my, my vision. Or adjacent to somebody who's willing to build somebody sure. who's got something in place part part of the i'm liking what he's saying in part because this gets us towns under the belt this gets us approved we've got we've actually built something it's actually out there and that gives us gravitas i don't know where i want it well and and, and i have to say i haven't learned to velco maps in a number of years but what you're saying is true. So you, they don't necessarily need to be contiguous DC fiber as long as you have a Velco substation in that town. And because I know DC fiber is connected to Velco, so it isn't adjacent geographically necessarily a requirement. Right, but so, they're saying they don't want to go way up there. They want to. Well, they want to be contiguous. They're still going to be rolling trucks from Royalton, right? 
So rolling trucks from Royalton to Worcester is a bit of a... They're, they're not going to... No, they're going to be hiring Eustace. Eustace is... No, 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 no. Tech, tech support installs, oh. not, not, the, not the actual construction. Okay. So yeah, they would be hiring Eustace or whomever to, to go out do the actual construction, but once the people are turned on and they have, you know, need tech support, which happens or something, you know, they, they need to put some people in front of customers, it doesn't... They don't want to go down. No. So it makes sense for them to stretch a little bit and go to Roxbury, Northfield, Williamstown, somewhere, you know, again, those are all, thankfully, most of our towns are reasonably easily accessible by I-89. Okay. It just seems that we should be doing it an easy way rather than trying to invent a new way. And so ValleyNet, like you said, has come to us and said, we want to do it. So why wouldn't we do it? Is there a reason not to? And if there's no reason not to, then let's let the sleeping dog at Belco sleep for a little while longer. Nobody else is going to jump in there. And once you show that you're successful and you have income, then you can go and start spreading out, um, you know, like measles in the community. <laughs> so it's so it's your it's point, I think that's your point, is just, you know, start. Does it bind us in perpetuity to value that? No, no, and they explicitly, well, and they yeah, explicitly right. said that they, but they wanted to have a guarantee that we would be with them for several years, at least. But, but why not? What, what, it, what it, it, it could be the easy way. It is an easy way. There's no doubt about it. It's an easy way. But it could not necessarily be the way we want for the long term, because we don't. Well, that's the why not. I mean, so I, mean, I want to explain yeah. my my version of a why not. Okay. You know, I might still vote for it. Right. But, but why not is that we're locked into their way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense to do it their way here and another way here and another way here. It's really bad to have multiple systems. You want to have an integral system that you're comfortable with, that you can afford, that you can manage. And they will do it their way. They will want to do it their way. It's conceivable we could say, yeah, we want you to do this, but we want to use different technology. Would you do that for us? And maybe they'd say yes. I don't know. But I think we need to talk about that part, because if we do four towns their way, we've pretty much decided that that's the way we're going to do 17 or 20 towns. And we need to know if that's the way we want to do it, technically. So are you talking about like specific equipment? Like we're going to buy these routers, and we're only ever going to buy these routers yeah, ever again. Well, right. Well, well there's different way. protocols. There's do, it's not just routers. It's like, are we doing active Ethernet? Yeah, are we I'm doing, just trying to wrap my brain I know. I'm, I'm, so yeah. this, are you going to do GPON, or are you going to use EPON? Those are three different ways of I'll building like it. That seems better. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and are you, if, for example, if you do GPON, which is what they do, which a lot of places do, you are buying into one manufacturer's microsystem because they don't talk to each other. But if you buy, if you go into EPON, it's a standards-based system, and there's multiple companies that work with each other. But Valinet doesn't use that. But Valinet doesn't use that. So that's a big question to, to settle. Or and then we might want to do we're not on Valinet, we're selling all this equipment that talks to EPON. What? Well, well, and, 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 and EC Fiber itself started with one set of equipment, and partway through their build, like four or five years later, decided, you know, we're not so happy with this, and they started going to this other one. And now they're replacing the first stuff with the second one because they're proprietary to one manufacturer. So they learned from a mistake. They chose something they didn't like, and now they're choosing something else. I'm not saying their choices are wrong. I'm just saying we need to technically evaluate stuff and decide, yes, that's what we're buying into, because we are for a long time. And that, that's the point. And that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, would that be something that would be included in the feasibility study? Like, what are the relative costs and benefits of different technology types? It can be. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. I'm, I'm not sure that that was in the scope of Well, no, I, I guess I'm just wondering where we're going to get that information from. 
Well, we talk to the people who are in here who know <laughs> okay. the differences between such things, and we sit down with with that mm -hmm. and talk about what's what's right. possible and what's not. I sure. know. Right. Um, so Greg's experience is with active Ethernet, but not for providers of the home. So it was more long haul and more big business kinds of accounts. My experience is with EPON. Um, I, there's probably no one in the room that's experienced with GPON. GPON is the most popular system in the country. So they're all three good systems, but they're very different. And, and GPON is 20 to 30 percent more expensive. I, that would be my argument. But yeah. But it's a single manufacturer. Yeah. But if we decided we wanted to go with a less expensive GPON, we wouldn't be doing Valley now. None of we could say, Valinet, we'd like to work with you, but we want to use this equipment in our system. And they system. might say? And they might say yes. Okay. I don't know. All right. So this is what I'm talking about, about establishing the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a number of, of things that go into it, and then, and then making a decision. But just saying, well, they're there, and you know, they're the easy one. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's an easy decision to make, but it's not necessarily encompassing everything you might want. Well, the comment about lots of manufacturers versus one manufacturer, I think, is, is really telling. And, you know, one manufacturer could be taken over by somebody that you don't want to have them, you know, running your system. Is there a window? On this, is there, is there, will this offer be sunsetted at any point in the near future from Valinet, working with Valinet? Um, not, well, yes and no. Um, no in that they're likely to continue to want to, wanting to work with us. Um, yes in that we are going to need to get to that Vita pot of money first. Yeah. Or second. But not, but not third. <laughs> so my concern is, with all due respect to the August body, body of people who are assembled here tonight, <laughs> with all your information and expertise, my concern, my real concern, is that we got to, you know, grab this kettle while it's hot. I don't know the metaphor. Move quickly. <laughs> there, yes, we have to move quickly, and I'm concerned that while we, if we were to deliberate and, qui and quibble and discuss that this money will vanish before our, our, our eyes. So I'm inclined to say yes, work with ValleyNet, and then any sort of nuances about will they give us due deference when it comes to wanting to use certain kinds of technology in this region versus the other, well, that can be worked out in a contract, right? It's well, up to them. No, no, it's up to them to say yes or no. They were willing to work with they're the seller. But they're going to be the. Uh, they want to be the operators. Is that correct? Yeah. So they want. They're going to have their network management system. They're going to be watching stuff. And are they going to want to watch two different kinds of systems? Maybe not. Well, whatever agreement we don't know. And so whatever yeah. agreement is, if I would say we we move to work with them, and then whatever agreement needs to be ratified and signed between these two parties, us and them, then we can hammer out the details later, or we can assign it to a committee, or we can leave it to the experts in the room. And, but I'm inclined to just move forward at this time. Well, I, moving forward is too. important, but yeah. what, what I've heard is there's not been a specific proposal from Valley Net. So that would seem to be close. That, that's, that's like next step, next yeah. few weeks. Right. I, I, I want to go and find out what those what that looks like, but, actually. And, and, and simultaneously, moving as quickly as we can to educate and inform ourselves so you're able to evaluate a proposal from them. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know what, if it's satisfactory. So I don't think we should stop exploring so, so can, ValleyNet. Thing. Can, can I sure. grab a couple people and go down to ValleyNet with you, people who are interested in debating the finer points, and then we can have that conversation with the folks down there? Sure, I'm on the go. Great. Michael? I got Greg and Michael. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to talk talk turkey with Valionet? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Problem? I did, I would. The people with technical expertise. You know, it's very important, and the technical expertise is very good. But as an organization, my belief is we're buying off the shelf. So. 
it's, it's, you're going to have to know what you're buying off the shelf. It's like if you go to buy a car, you know, I'm not going to sit there and know how to put the car together. I may be interested in horsepower, transmission ratios, et cetera. There may be things of interest, but, and I may know a lot about an engine, but I'm buying a car. I'm not buying parts of a car to take home and put together. So I really think, that I, I agree with that, you know, forward motion is really about most important from my point of view. And that we need to look at this and say, listen, we, we've been listening to people, we've been talking about getting something off the shelf so we can get something that runs well and works well. And pick an organization that has a track record that meets that. That's what I would say would be the criteria. And then where we hook up is where the feasibility studies and that organization they hook us up can say. I think it, it falls pretty naturally once we decide to move forward. There's a lot of, I guess I have a lot of concern about this, that we don't have, I lack information. Um, we've not done a feasibility study. I don't really have any outline of the technical trade-offs. I don't have any outline of the business and cost trade-offs. I don't know that I even want ValleyNet to be a partner. There's going to be a lot of partners out there. We have an issue doing RFP. We don't, you know, there's so much we haven't done. And I realize there's a sense of urgency that you don't want to lose grant money but I also don't want it to be a de facto decision. And like I have pretty strong concerns about that. I think it should be semi-informed. So I guess I'm a little bit more like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on here? Let's, let's talk about how long that pot of money is going to be there. Because that seems to be part of what's driving us. We don't want to miss out. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to be bestowed on other CUDs and it's gone. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the first money isn't going to go out the door for quite some time because they're trying to get educated and they're going to lean on the Department of Public Service for advice because they really don't know telecom. Can you define quite some time? <laughs> More than a year. Okay. Um, the first money will go out within a year, but it, I don't think it will all go in the first 12 months from now. We'll also uh, do you think it will? I think it will. You think it will? Yeah. What's the total amount of money that's going to be available? 10.8 uh, 10 million. 10.8 okay. million and up to 4 million per. Right. Okay. So Kingdom Fiber isn't going to ask for 4 million. So that helps, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what is Linden all going to ask for if they've already got their CD? No, what's Newbury going to ask for? What's the Southern Vermont group? What's Burlington Telecom going to ask is, for? Is the Fiber going to be able to? EC Fiber could ask for it if they wanted to. They, I don't think they will. They, they, they don't really need to, though. No. But I, my prediction is that no one's going to get $4 million. That there'll be a bunch of one and a half, two million awards. I mean, and they have to be, it's reasonable that some other CUDs have to be at a build-ready phase, too. And they're behind us. Like, they haven't even really formed. Right. So, but the other thing is, it doesn't have to be CUDs. This is not explicitly for sure. the CUDs. Right. Kingdom Fiber is not. So Kingdom right. Fiber is doing this. Right. New Newbury is a ready district. Um, but other for-profit entities, so Champlain Valley, they could go apply for this stuff. The folks who are up in Chittenden County, I, I forget who they are, they can do this. Burlington Telecom could. Um, so these bigger organizations are not going to be looked at favorably by VITA because the intent of the legislation is to serve people who can't go to bond markets, who can't go to banks, commercial banks, and get loans. They're going to favor startups. Yes, but if startups haven't come to them, but these other places have, oh, that's true. they'll give them the money. I have served on a state transfer, well, I'll just say the state transportation alternatives committee when it still existed. Mm -hmm. We have dispersed, dispensed rather, millions, millions, I'm not, I don't run this, <laughs> somewhere around $20 million yeah. in like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. And, and that the money is just go. obligated and it's decided and then it's gone and then there it is. Yeah. And, and there's no it, it doesn't take it it's it's fast. How much how easy it is. Well, that's that, not that may be so. writing though. This is, these aren't grants, they're loans. Sure, sure. But and V is not gonna underwrite a loan in thirty minutes. No. I mean it is gonna go fast, but it's not gonna be that fast. So you're saying it won't be a year. And you're saying uh, it won't be a year. Yeah, I'm saying Do I you think, think it'll be six months? I, I, I think for, from the from the window of time that they open the application process, it, I would say less than maybe just, just right right around a year. I would say it'll all be gone. There's a fair amount of political pressure on this, and the governor's eyeballs are on it. Sure. And 
and I, my experience is the governor's looking at it, it's the most important thing on MPEG's desk. What's our timeline till we get, get our RFP out, select a consultant, and get a business model written? Probably about the end of the year. So that's five more months. Yeah. So that's less than the year. Yeah. We should, before that's done, we should be looking at possible models, but we, I think, should rely on the results of that thing before we apply to beta. Right. And part of, you know, part of the grant that we applied for with USDA involves ValleyNet, Stan and ValleyNet helping us do this, partially with this, with this, you know, potential project in mind. So, um, he, he and they are necessarily part of our feasibility study process. So yes, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. So I think that that window allows us to make the right decision before we sign up the dotted line on the loan application. But because they've explicitly said you know, that they will help us draft that language and essentially have a <clears throat> shovel-ready project you know, ready to go and present to Vita, um, we, we, yeah, we will have say, and we, we should understand, have a better context of well, that, what that the district looks good, like. At what cost? I mean, so it sounds like nobody knows what they want to charge. No, I can tell you what they, what they so charge what? Well, what would they charge for any aspect of what they are going to do? Valley is not charging anything. I mean, so. No, they, no, for operating it, that's an example. They're not charging anything to operate it. They will they will take their their costs like they've taken their costs from EC Fiber. They are not a for profit entity. They are a nonprofit. I see. Yeah. So okay. so they will take their cost. We will pay them for the things that they do. So they have you know twenty employees and their office space, electricity and all of the, the equipment that they buy for us, and you know, they will apportion their. Um, their employees, those folks that are working on our projects, and we will pay them for that, and that will come out of our revenues and such. But it will be a similar. I'm, okay, so I'm, I'm I'm saying this not informed by any sort of contract or agreement between us, but what they've s suggested would be that the agreement would be very similar to the relationship that they have with EC Fiber. So there could potentially be two contracts. One with Valley Net and one with EC Fiber. Mm -hmm. Well, necessarily, we would have to send an interconnecting agreement with EC Fiber because EC Fiber owns the owns the network. Probably just from the connecting agreement. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think that we should understand, though, that you know there is this money today, but there will be more money tomorrow. If this works, then the state will will feel like we've got to help more. You know, we're not going to be able, no matter what we think, we're not going to be able to get everybody. It's going to take more money, and it's going to take more money than that. So there will be more money. There'll be another, either an addition to 513 or a grant process or something. Because once, once, you know, EC Fiber has already proved that they can do it. And when we come along and we can do it, there's going to be lots of other places in the state that need to be covered. Yeah. So, but I do think no that no one's going to get it twice. No, but they, they, but the other things. No, I don't agree. I think that there will be money out there for us to say, you know, we spent our four million or whatever it was, and we were really successful, but it cost more, or there's more people that we didn't reach because it was ill in the way or whatever. But I think, you know, we're talking about Vermont, and we're not just talking about ourselves. We're, you know, we're going to be part of this whole movement, really, mm -hmm. that's going to grow. So we, we, we should try to go out there and be successful, rather than try and go out there and be unique. So we can prove that we use the money properly, we got results with the money, and now we need more. So, it makes a point, you make a point about using equipment that you can buy off the shelf from anybody, but if they say, you know, we'll do it, we'll start tomorrow, but we're going to use G-PON instead of E-PON, then, then we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be thinking, oh, we need more flexibility. We should be saying, we want to be successful. And I think that's also your point, that, that we want to 
we want to be successful. In order to be successful, we have to be off. We have to be off the blocks. We have to. Be you have to the, define what it would be to be successful. Well, it's the so, state that's going to say what's successful. That's no, that's I what it's going to come. Think, I think repayment. Abilities. Well, that's <laughs> also true, but but so I'd rather get one and a half million dollars and sign up. You know, 400 homes, then get $4 million and not know what to do with it. Yeah, me too. Well, 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 well they're, yeah, they're, it's unlikely that they would write us a loan for $4 million if we don't know what to do with it. But no, I, you're, yeah, I think I, I, I take your point. Jamal? I, one thing I wanted to say is that, so I've lived in Vermont since 93, and I have been anxious. I was connected on computers in Alaska when I, before I moved to Vermont to. A BBS network. And so I've been anxious for connectivity for a very long time. BBS. We were like the second customers in Montpelier when Sovereignet came through. It was, we were on top of this and very anxious for this. And so I've been watching how this has been going for a long time. We have, you know, like this groundswell of support that pops up. And suddenly there's some state money that comes in. The companies get it, they spend it, they don't do what they say they're going to do. There's very little response to that, and then the, the swell of support fades away, and we another 10 years goes by before there's another groundswell of, gee, we have to do something about this. What I'm concerned about is we're at that, that swell right now. We've got the state money, and I want us to get that money. I don't want the companies to get that money because they're just not going to do what they promised. And then all of that is going to fade away, and the political will is going to all fade away. Well, now, the, don't now the, be one of those companies that doesn't fulfill its promise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't see us doing that. That that's I, well, we're, but we're not being you know cognizant about how we approach this. Right. We could end up inadvertently going down a hole we didn't mean to. And Clark Burroughs and Telecom did. But the political managed. landscape has changed. Yeah. The regulatory oh, landscape is changing. And so we're in a different position now. Yeah. I think we're in a much okay. better but position now. But I don't want that political will to fade. And there, I don't is, want this to be. Is there a decision we're trying to make here? No, no. This is more, more like vision looking. What's what's the strategy going going forward? I mean, I like I said, I have my, my vision for how we go forward. That's not clearly not, not everybody's. I, I would just like us all to be rowing in the same direction and go into the next few months that if we do have timelines and um, <clears throat> other things, other decisions that we need to make as our as our target, that we should start um, taking a crack at that. Not to mention that we have to, um, we are statutorily obliged to write an annual report and budget. And if whatever, you know, whatever our big ideas are for what we're doing next year, if that budget doesn't include the thing that we're doing next year, <laughs> why, why bother? Yeah. So if, just hypothetically speaking, if we're going after the $4 million VITA loan, our, our budget for 2020 ought to have that listed, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so so no, no decisions concretely. I just want to make sure, I want to start um, moving towards, if not consensus, at least um, kind of general goodwill towards, you know, some strategic objectives. So uh, is there a timeline for applying for the $4 million? Are we applying for the $4 million? Is there a decision we made for that? Not at present. Okay. Is there a, de is there a time when the applications are due? No. Nope. They haven't even started that yet. Okay. I'm, so we have imagined, I think you said, Mike, we imagined it well, January. Okay. Well, one thing I think that we do know that we could be uh, Defining is if there's a 10% down payment, if you will, what what's the strategy for getting that mm -hmm. money and whatever that is then informs this is how much we're going to be able to borrow. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that actually can be taken on. Sure. I mean, yeah. if, again, if, if that's something that we're going to pursue. Well, I think the next 10 step. 10% of 4 million is. 400 grand. 400 grand, and that's not going to just be in kind from Bellingham. That. That's a lot of money. Okay. So, so, how, so that's a, I don't know. How do we find that? No, so, so, so maybe the, there's an earlier question that we need to ask is do we go after the $4 million of VITA money that was essentially written into statute for us? <laughs> just saying. <laughs>
Yes. 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 Work is to raise four hundred thousand. I think a good next step was was for the delegation to to go with you, Jeremy, to ValleyNet, have this discussion, and then report back to this board next month about you should go to what their proposal is, and then we can have a vote okay. as to whether or not to decide to pursue the four million. I mean, we should seriously. Well, I don't see the. I don't see them as couple decisions. I mean, you don't have to use ValleyNet as your provider. Like, but but you would have to go to you, have to have a build plan. you would have to go to the through the, to the loan application with your, with, you know, with your Correct. construction and your um, right. But isn't that part operate. of what we would get out of some of this grant money that we hopefully are going to get in terms of doing feasibility? But could we decide on an operator and a build plan? I don't know. I, yeah, I know what you're asking. Well, there are well, different there are different elements, and they can be worked on simultaneously. I, I so think evaluation of value that. And their proposal is one thing. Right. There has to be money. I mean, Valley is not going to be ponying up any money, so there has to be, you know, raising the ten percent, and that's going to inform the top line of what so, you raise. So that that's not necessarily true. They were one of the first investors in EC Fiber. They were one of the, the sources of seed money. It wasn't as much as some people put it, but we I'm, also had like the woman. I forgot the Alaska woman. <laughs> I don't remember all my names, and I should, you know, be more prepared. But you know, who was somebody who both very knowledgeable and resourceful, and you know, obviously would be a candidate for me to engage in terms of helping us understand this a little bit. And you know, are they? You know, I, I guess I'm a little confused because we we were you know, we've had a number of people come before the board and make presentations. Some which were a little out there, some which were kind of neat, and I thought pretty informative. And I we just seem to have like. Never, you know, gone. That was great. Okay, we're going to go ballet net now, and that, that's a little strange. No, these are these are parallel tracks. These are these are parallel because so how can we afford that? Because we are waiting on we are waiting on grant money that will pay for that feasibility study. We will, we're still going to do that. That's still happening, and that will probably be, we'll probably I'll hopefully be able to finish that by the end of the year. But once we hear from USDA for sure that we've gotten that. If we get that, then we can um, we can move forward with the RFI RFP process and go and get that. So again, that goes back to that question: Is there a compelling reason to make any decision about ValleyNet before that process has started? I don't. We don't even. We can't even apply for the loan yet. So I mean, I, it's okay to do informative discussions. I think it's great. You the, know, and the, the, the more we learn, the better. The project the USDA loan um, envisions involves Stan Williams at ValleyNet helping us with the finances, essentially building that business plan and building the financial model. So it doesn't obligate us, of course, to go with ValleyNet, but it, insofar as he is um, a big part of, of ValleyNet, um, doing these things at the same time I mean, makes a lot of sense. So any of the money that we might envision us getting awarded or have awarded here in the short term for study work, could we engage the Alaska one? I expect that we would we would engage someone but, like that. But you just said we have to use no. Stan Stan Williams is giving us in kind free work oh, to do this. Okay. So that we could meet get so he's giving us twenty thousand, five thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars of okay. in kind okay. financial consultation work. That was that got us a couple more points towards okay. um, you said to do this. What is this? Okay. Okay. I can look at the you look at that um, feasibility study and business plan. But biz, r writing the business model and doing the finances. He's the chief financial officer of ValleyNet. Writing a business plan. And yes, and I can go and look at. So why are we hiring an R? Why are we doing an RFP for a consultant to stand us writing us a business plan? Because because he's not doing a feasibility study. He's not doing the other. I mean, I I can send you again the. Um, the application for the USDA money for uh, feasibility study and business planning that didn't that got maybe halfway halfway right right yeah. so we have the thing for Vermont innovation grant which stuff we we, which we still need to match a little bit more from and we have our original the original funds that would be doing that matching so that gets us you know nearly there so having that extra, you know, having the, the finance guy being willing to sit down and do that extra work so that we don't have to pay the consultant to do that part of the work, that's that's why he's are we, in, are we applying for one of the $60,000 
feasibility for business model grants from Department of Public Service. I, 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 when, when does that open, close, and whatever? Probably in January or something late. Right. Yeah. yeah, probably in the fall. So it's, you know, once those are open and available, and that's that's something that we can dovetail into a larger, maybe at that point, more like planning for construction phase, then, yeah, I don't see why not. But the timing's wrong, because we want to get going sooner. Right. right. There's plenty of grant funding at all times of the year for what we're envisioning. There's community facilities, USDA community facilities grants. There's the DCDP grant program, which is block grant money. There's, it, I don't think we should hesitate or pause our work in order to wait on I agree. grant funds. No, we should we be continually applying to anything we hear of? That's a decision for this body or for a grant committee or, you know, or, yeah, I, I would say yes. I would say yes. So will somebody find the next one that we should be <laughs> applying for? And I thought he just put, volunteered. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have con real conflicts of interest, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but knowing what those are and what the timelines are and how they fit into our larger plan. So again, what's that timeline? What's that strategic vision look like? You know, can do we realistically think that we can get a, you know, business plan and feasibility study and the survey stuff done by the end of the year? I think I, I think it might yeah. be might be a little bit tight, but I, th I think we can do it. And then looking at applying for uh, Vita construction money in January as the next step. Um, if that's the if that's the reality, then yeah, so what, what loan do we look at for at next? Probably the timing would be something that could be used as a match for the Vita money or something that could be um, some additional planning for the engineering or some supplementary construction money like the, um, what's the money that come, the connectivity initiative. So if we're like look, re looking to reach that last guy at the top of the hill, there's state money, in addition to the Vita money, state money to go and get that last guy at the top of the hill. I mean, you applied for some I, of those. I've gotten those grants. They're, they're, they're not to be disregarded, but they're not a good path to getting serious money to build something. N nickels and dimes, but in terms yeah. of if we're going to be building something, every little bit could help. Our account increased by $10 this last week. <laughs> Don't spend it all on this, right? Uh, so you may not like be able to... Oh, oh, like, hold on a second. Okay. Like the joining the valley now, when, when you make the, the, the meeting. The, the, you'd like to join? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Secondly, the, uh, four, the $4 million, um, uh, I, we're not going to get $4 million and turn it over to Valley Net. Here's $4 million, go do the thing. I'm assuming that they're going to get paid as they perform. Uh, and as they build out, right? So that over a period of year, two years, we'll have this $4 million that will be standing. I heard that there's no principal or interest payments for two years. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's not gonna start on January 1st when you get that $4 million. It'll actually be kind of a line of credit and you'll be paying here's a million dollars or here's $250,000 to go do some work and the two years starts with that mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And so we'll, we'll We'll expend this over a two-year period, mm -hmm. which means that we'll, three years out, four years out, we'll be making you know, total payments uh, for all of that. Okay, I just want to make sure that was clear. I, 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 I've not dealt with Vita loans before, but any, any other more informed <coughs> people in the house, if, is that more what it looks like, what Ray's talking about? They don't just write us a check for $4 million. It'll be in tranches, but I don't know if it'll be like a line of credit. It'll be something in between, but yeah. Term, probably term on multiple disbursements. Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, several things. One is, uh, I'm assuming Vita would be like any regular lender that the 10% money can't be another loan. Not to be a grant or a real grant cash. or, or in kind. money raised, but it can't or, be debt. In kind, they they do accept in kind. But it's going to be justified. Right. So, so are, are you saying back that you could have a, like a supplementary? Yeah. 
Rita allows for uh, other loans to be making we, up that? We do that kind of lending all the time. Really? Okay. Could you use a revolving loan fund to, or to serve as bridge financing or whatever until a grant comes in or something like that? I would assume so. Because there's a number of communities in this room that have RLFs. Right. Or um, really get, like we talked about last year about looking at how BC Fiber did with promissory notes. Right. Right. Looking at those people who want to help out and they could put some money into this and again with deferred interest or something like that and pay them back. Yeah, but there are so many people who put up 100,000 each. That's a hard thing to find. Yeah, that's that's true. On, on the other hand, if, you know, for people who are reasonably sure that we're going to get the project actually built, we're looking at you know supporting a four million dollar yeah. loan that might look more attractive. Right. You know? For um, the uh, donations that you were referring to, there are people with more money would be able to get their immediate benefit is they get the write off. Yes, they would want the project to succeed, but mm -hmm. you get up front their benefit. Sure, but if, a, if it's a promissory note, an unsecured loan, essentially. No, I was referring to yeah. the donations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but, but in uh, comparison to that, you know, but if they're getting, you know, seven percent, eight percent, whatever the going rate would be for that, right. um, and they believe in the, in the project, then that could be another, maybe another angle there. Right. But I think that sort of stuff comes out of the, the feasibility study and the business plan because, yeah, there there still has to be. That's a that that's a gap. The twelve thousand five hundred was supposed to be easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a, yeah. Uh, I partially laid that one in my at my own feet. Yeah. Find that no problem. Just to get my couch a little bit more, right? Um, so yeah. Um, I think for the for the next meeting, I'm going to try to have an annual report um, written. I will probably have to attend remotely. Um, I think I'm going to be on a road trip. Kids, so maybe like phoning in from some random hotel room somewhere. Um, so Phil will probably ask you to do that again, but I will try to get an annual an annual report draft, maybe not even something anything like final, but just out there so we can talk about what's happened the last year, what we're hoping to happen the next year, and then um, I would like some budget ideas? Was that something that was going to come out of the Finance Committee, or you wanted to talk about that more here, mm -hmm. as, I, as I recall? I'm not laying that one strictly on you, but, but, but re refresh my memory where we left that discussion. Well, the last I remember, I, I was under the impression that the, yeah, it was kind of, kind of the, the budget development itself was going to kind of be taken up by the executive committee. And, <laughs> and, the, the, and the reason, listen, it, it's logical as hell. I mean, what we found out at the finance committee was we just had no way to connect revenues with expenses. You just think we could make it up? Well, easily. you guys, listen, you guys are sitting there kind of at the nexus of committees. And for the most part, you know, the business development committee is probably the one that should be sitting down doing a, a budget this year because they're the ones that have been talking about the, uh, uh, the, the business plans. They're the ones that are talking about, um, you know, which grants to go out and get primarily, right? I mean, this is where the revenues have been coming from and where the expenses. So it may not be the business development committee that develops the budget, but I think really right now that's where the budgetary information is going to come from. It's, that's what, I, I mean, that, that's where the known expenses and revenues are, the anticipated expenses and revenues are known at. They're not known, uh, you know, in the finance committee. Okay, so can I can I ask everybody to send me, I don't want to say your, your wish list, but if you have ideas about what needs to be in the budget, um, even if it's the, you know, some of the big stuff that we've talked about, just shoot me an email. I will try to aggregate all of these things. So, yeah, I'm, and what I'll do is I'll try to remove the overlap of things that people submit, you know, that are duplicated. But just knowing, knowing that there's more than just, you know, me and Phil and Becca making this up, um, so that we can put it together. Because I mean. Literally the budget last year, I don't know if you remember, for those of you who were here, that, that, was, that was me sitting down one afternoon and taking some information, I think from reading I had with you, Michael, just kind of like throwing something against the wall, and everybody was like, eh, good enough. 
Um, I think we're going to have to start taking it a bit more seriously. I want to make sure I'm not going to miss anything. So if there are expenses, if there are revenue sources, if there are things that I'm, I or we are uh, likely to miss or things that we need to make sure that we account for, please send it my way. And even if this is some, some sort of like disjointed, you like wake up in the middle of the night like, oh my god, we forgot about this. Just, just send it to me in an email and I'll collect it and hopefully do something intelligent with it. Anything else anybody wants to talk about with next steps, strategy, budget, and your report? Good. Uh, Backward items, committee assignments, and memberships. Do we need to be assigning anything to committees? Um, um, because of contract negotiations I've been involved in, I've had, I've had they, they just consistently been lining up with these meetings for uh, CB5. So I, I probably am not good as a chair of a committee right now. I, I anticipate at least for the next couple of months the schedule is going to keep, continue to clash, and my priorities are really going to the negotiations. I can't. Okay. Who else is on the finance committee? Javon. One of you Al here, or? No. Uh, no, you can't. You're a, uh, you're, you're a hired help without yeah. pay. <laughs> you get what you pay for, though. <laughs> we got more than we pay for, again. Bob, 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 we haven't heard from him. No, we uh, haven't heard from Bob because he's not, so he's not the there. delegate or alternate. He's not and there anymore. Alan Gilbert? I, I haven't been told I'm on the committee yet. That's right. right. I thought I knew what I was going to do it, and I thought John had been clear. John, are you on? You're on the committee. Well, I went to the first meeting. Right. Oh. The first week of. So you're on. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 that makes you chair. <laughs> <That's laughs> <that's laughs> <that's laughs> you're not the chair. <laughs> you're the chair. I was in a proposing grants committee. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't okay. get finance. Well, so so we can still have a grants committee too. But um, does so? What does the finance committee have on its agenda right now, or is this something that can be modeled? I mean, you you really can do away with the uh, finance committee. The only thing left to do now, we successfully jettisoned everything else. Is <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. so 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 maybe we can just agree to leave the finance committee where it is. Maybe when things stabilize a bit, we could bring it back. Or when there's to like, bills to review. Yeah, bills to read, because yeah, right now there's really no treasure work to oversee. I mean, we're getting the full reports there, right? I, so, right, we are. Okay. So, 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 Ram, if I could ask you just to just be the chair in NCGF for a little while longer, and uh, if anything gets too serious, I'm sure Siobhan will pick up your stuff. Absolutely. Great. And if you need help in warning meetings and all, get hold of me. I mean, seriously, it's simple to do, but you know, I mean, if you're not used it's to it, it's to everybody, hmm? as opposed to everything else. I can just do a reply to all on that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. When when it comes to plan, open meeting law, when you're planning meetings or plan, or when you're planning meeting times, dates, and agenda items, feel free to communicate as often as uh, as you want. Just don't discuss okay. an agenda item. Okay, so um, you mentioned the grants committee. I just did. I did. That would be great. And what's the what's the charter of this? The uh, charter of the grants committee would be to look for grants. Okay. See if we can qualify for these grants and go get them. There. All in favor say aye. And oversee and oversee the grants that we've got get in some place. Grants. Okay. Um, so that we can we can make sure that the, the, those reports are being met, and okay. I would be willing to chair that. Oversee reporting or do do do, <laughs> do the reporting. Oversee the finance committee. Yeah, I have the finance committee. Do report directly. Okay, so uh, Shivan, you're volunteering. Anybody else want to participate in the grants committee? You will want more than. <laughs> you, you will want more than three people. You will need four people on that, lest you run into those hilarious open meeting quorum, hilarious. Uh, can it can it can be one person? Oh, so it, so <laughs> it, you you could you could be assigned as a. But person. I'm not allowed to think about anything without having a meeting. Well, 
<laughs> so, so no, so we, we would constitute we would constitute a committee. We would simply say that you would be our grants coordinator. Oh, that's a different thing. And okay. you can just own that and do that as you like. Oh, and then you, yeah, <laughs> and then dra drag in any people as necessary. That, that, that would be part of our warning. That would be part of our So, okay. yeah. so, so Phil, Phil, Phil just moves yes. that appointment. Yes. I will second that. Um, any further discussion about um, putting Siobhan in charge of grants? Do I get to vote on Shh. that? No. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you can vote. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion passes. Congratulations. You've just, you've just received a whole bunch of committee work just for yourself. Yeah. Be very careful. You become a career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. So we already talked about the back burner items, other towns, uh, equipment policy. Um, we have not talked about uh, equipment policy. We should probably do that at some point, um, especially with some of the news items in, out there lately about uh, first lights. Like, promise we don't have any Huawei equipment, except for those ones who have the green lights on in our co location space that somebody took a picture of. No, they're not running. But they're not hooked up. They're not hooked up to anything. Sure. So to save power, you usually unplug things or turn them off. But anyways, I'm being, I'm being sarcastic. So we should probably also adopt a similar policy, um, especially if we decide to do any work with the state down the road, which unfortunately our alternate from Northfield is not here, the chief information officer of the state of Vermont. He can tell us all about the wonderful things going on. Well, I didn't know if he was still even on the board. He's, he's the alternate. He's the alternate. Okay. Anyways, um, actually, that equip that Huawei equipment cannot has is totally unimportant. So the serious stuff that could possibly spy is not that stuff. But well, whatever. Yes, that's not. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, 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 I'll invite I'll, I'll invite John to come and we do, do a dissertation. This is the case that the, the, the lying and denial is worse than the crime. Exactly right. right. Exactly yes. right. We could just grab the state wording okay. and say, this, so, is, this is our policy. I don't see any other back burner items to talk about then. Um, all of you got a copy of the uh, the meeting minutes for uh, the June 11th meeting. You may want to take a quick look over that and say, have anything else to change? Shelf, there's a difference between a Jaguar and a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> a Prius will go further on the battery than the Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> the Jaguar can't get out of his park. <laughs> that's, what, that's my comment. <laughs> so, fun one that the Indiana reference in 2008, I was at this little conference actually that I got this bag with, and I saw a dude make a presentation on putting Wi-Fi routers in barns and silos so that he could get a mesh network going in some rural part of Indiana. And I thought it was one of the coolest things, presentations I've ever seen at the conference. <laughs> Got nothing. Yes. I'm curious what the Starlink business is about and if it will impact our work at all. What's, what's Starlink, this? Elon Musk's Oh, low flying Starlink. satellite Amazon designed did. to bring broadband to the world. Too. There, there yeah. are multiple companies doing this. Stuff. It's yeah. fascinating. I would like to hear more about it from the experts. I don't know anything else. Yeah, still, still latency issues. Yeah. No, and, and only one. Very, 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 very,
Okay. Can I just interrupt for a second? <laughs> speed of light. Every single kind of internet we have goes speed of light. No, it's not true. It's it is lawyer. true. No, <laughs> it is true. In fact, <laughs> wireless, 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 wireless is fast. Here. Fight, 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 fight around the city. Sorry, I'm sorry. But there's a bar <laughs> over there. <laughs> <laughs> I passed. Oh, I had some, but it's gone now. Okay. Was it about that? No. Good. Um, in terms of mesh, that was actually the uh, the first thing that I was looking at in terms of building for bringing um, better connectivity around uh, in the area. As a matter of fact, Ray, I don't remember. Don't, don't know if you remember us talking at lunch three years ago, four years ago. You had like just moved here. You're like. Public private partnership. And I'm like, mesh. You know, like, uh, um, Newport, Vermont has a mesh. Yeah. They're building up there. One of the um, Newport mesh advocates, she was actually at that Northeast Kingdom. Yeah, she has 15 customers. Yes. And nobody pays. And, uh, and it's, it's, and, and, I, and I have good relationships with folks that build a citywide mesh in Berlin, Germany, um, called Freifunk. And they actually have weekly meetings and are building all the firmware, building all the, all the software for the routers and stuff and putting, putting them out there and getting laws passed so they stick these things on top of public buildings and it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's quite cool. So, that's all I got. So I have I'm a question going, about the next meeting. Yes. Is it August 9th? That's a Friday. Is that intentional? That was probably me just pasting that in wrong because uh, today's Today meeting is June 9th. July. July. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> What's my name again? 13th, August 13th. 13th. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg. Yeah.